So, Professor Andrew Gamble, you are the author of one of the most important book on Thatcher's contributes to British economy, the free economy and the strong state. Uh, so, I would like you to give us an overview of uh, Thatcherism in economy and her contribution to, uh, to a big change in economy in Britain. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Lucca. I want to talk about Margaret Thatcher and the economy, and, and specifically her ideas about free markets. Margaret Thatcher has a reputation as an economic liberal. She was, she's sometimes been described both by her friends and by her critics as a 19th century Gladstonian liberal rather than a conservative. And some of her conservative critics actually doubted that she was a genuine conservative at all. Her apparent desire to give priority to the market and to roll back the state was seen by some as doctrinaire, as ideological, against the one nation statecraft of conservatism, which sought to govern a society, not an economy, and take account of the interests of all the people, not just those with property and wealth. And Thatcher, as a result, was often charged with trying to turn the clock back, to tear up the post-war settlement between capital and labor. It was alleged that she was guided by, too much guided by the thinking of foreign neoliberal theorists such as F.A. Hayek and Milton Friedman. And the ferment of ideas on the right of British politics in the 1970s led Maurice Cowling, a Cambridge historian, to fear what he called the odium theologicum had entered the conservatives and they were in danger of becoming an ideological party which up to that time they had avoided. The opposing view is that uh, we're looking in the wrong place, that Thatcher wasn't so much an economic liberal, but always a conservative who always pursued a conservative statecraft, that she was influenced by the ideas of economic liberals which flourished in such profusion in the 1970s and made some use of them, but they weren't the determinant of her politics. She herself famously did not attach very much importance to theory, but rather trusted her instincts. And these instincts had been shaped by her relationship with her father, Alfred Roberts, who was a grocer in Grantham, and her husband, Dennis Thatcher, who ran his own company and then became an oil executive. Margaret Thatcher was never an entrepreneur herself, and her views on the market and the way markets worked were shaped by these two formative experiences. She was an intensely practical person who disliked grand theory, preferring simple homespun truths. And her speeches are littered with those homespun truths. This view of her as an instinctive conservative notes that prior to her election to the leadership of the Conservative Party, there were few signs of the radicalism for which she was to become famous. She usually, before she became leader, she usually towed the party line. And although sympathetic to many of the ideas which Enoch Powell started advancing in the 1960s, she was never a powerlite. Similarly, though she formed a close bond with Keith Joseph, she was never intellectually adventurous in the way that he was in exploring the ideas of a new economic liberalism. Her major intellectual foray before she became leader was the uh, Conservative Political Center Lecture in 1968, which was entitled, What's Wrong with Politics? But this broke little new ground and certainly was not a manifesto 
for the new economic liberalism. Controversy and myths have always swirled around Thatcher. It has sometimes suited both her opponents and her admirers to present her in heroic terms. The lone warrior battling against the dragons of collectivism, struggling to realize or to restore free markets and limited government. This is not entirely wrong. What drew so many to her side and so alarmed others were her energy and her implacable will, her addiction to permanent revolution, her desire to go on and on, her insistence 10 years after becoming prime minister that, quote, we haven't even started yet. Others have pointed out, and, and Richard has done it today, again, how cautious in practice she was as a politician and how hard it often was to convince her to adopt the radical solutions which her ministers proposed. She had what all successful politicians need, extraordinarily, extraordinary luck allied to an innate sense of self-preservation which only deserted her right at the end. So I would argue it is, a, it is a mistake to think that Margaret Thatcher was primarily an ideologue. She was primarily a politician who adapted to the circumstances and the context which she found. The paradox of her political career is that she did not set out to transform the relationship between government and the market in the UK, but that is what she ended up doing. It is because she was not an ideologue herself, versed in the theoretical arguments for market liberalism deployed by economists and philosophers, that she attracted a lot of criticism from these ideologues. In the 1980s, many of them, including famously Milton Friedman, were very dissatisfied with the Thatcher experiment. There is a, was a huge amount of criticism from the economic liberals who thought that she was being far too timid, was giving priority to the wrong things, such as the, tar the particular version of monetarism that was adopted targeting Sterling M3, or the trade union reforms, or the caution in reducing public spending. So that uh, there was a huge amount of disquiet amongst the so-called true believers in the Thatcher project in the, uh, in the early 1980s as to whether the, uh, um, the Thatcher project was working. The ideologues were themselves divided over whether restoring a free economy should be done gradually, as Milton Friedman urged, or with the kind of sharp shock which Hayek favored. The, the argument for proceeding gradually was the one the Thatcher government embarked upon, but a combination of circumstances and miscalculations meant that what they delivered in 1979 to 81 was much closer to a sharp shock. As David Willits has remarked, though we were trying to do Friedman, we were actually doing Hayek. It produced an economic collapse and might have led to a political collapse as well, as many conservatives predicted at the time, but the government rode its luck, helped by the disunity in the opposition and then by the Falklands War, which was another accident, partly the result of uh, government incompetence and miscalculation. Thatcher's ability, however, to turn these events to her advantage was her supreme political skill. It made her unassailable for a time, and this allowed much more radical ideas for reshaping the relationship between government and the market to come forward, including privatization, more radical trade union reform, which between them were eventually transformative. Understanding Thatcherism as statecraft means that big changes in the relationship between market and state, which occurred in the 1980s, should be examined in relation to two particular contexts. The first of these, and often neglected in studies of the Thatcher government, is international. The key driver for changes in the economic policies of nation states in the 1970s and 1980s was the decision of the United States to first suspend and then dismantle the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate system. 
uh, in which they did in 1971, and, and subsequently to devise a new rule, set of rules for containing inflation and adjusting imbalances in the international economy. The UK was one of the first states to embrace the new order which the Americans were fashioning, first in 1976 with some assistance from the IMF, and then in 1979 when one of the first actions of the Thatcher government was to end all exchange controls. A remarkably bold step at the time, um, and one which was subsequently vindicated. But this decision meant accepting that Britain would have to sink or swim in the new and increasingly volatile global market. The role of a UK state was to make companies and workers aware of the disciplines which this imposed on them and on the more intense competition which they could therefore expect. The credit worthiness of the UK state and the standard of living of British workers was made once again dependent on the International Division of Labour and on the ability of British companies to compete successfully. Initially, the impact was to accelerate the decline of manufacturing, creating a permanent pool of unemployment and welfare dependency which has not been entirely resolved in the 30 years since. It put the UK in the forefront of what became known as globalization, which was marked in particular by the liberalization of financial and information flows, and later on by the huge enlargement of the global market through the incorporation of China, India, and the other rising powers. The policy of the Thatcher government would not have been possible without the change in US policy, but it was one which the Thatcher government enthusiastically embraced and it led to significant long-term change. There was no return to the financial stability of a 19th century gold standard, but there was a return to the 19th century emphasis on free trade. The confidence that 19th century British liberals had after Tory opposition had been defeated, that the UK could grow rich by abandoning national self-sufficiency in food production and opening its markets to the world importing from the cheapest producers to keep its own costs down and boost exports in those manufacturers and services where it had a comparative advantage. This return to free trade principles was also evident in the Thatcher government's dealings with the European Union. In 1986, Thatcher, as we've already heard, signed the most integrationist treaty of all, the Single European Act. The Thatcher government pressed for qualified majority voting in that treaty to ensure that protectionist member states would not be able to wield a veto against the advance of free trade across Europe. A third example was the Big Bang in London in 1986 when the Thatcher government completed the deregulation of the City of London, allowing foreign, particularly American banks, to set up in London and restoring to the city a greater degree of autonomy than it than it had enjoyed since before 1914. The symbiosis of Anglo-American finance, already foreshadowed in the euro-dollar market of the 1960s, was to become one of the engines of globalization and the 1990s boom, leading eventually to the dramatic events of 2008. The second context which should be examined in relation to Thatcher and the market is the domestic one. This is a view advanced, among others, by Shirley Letwin and Ewan Green. Letwin emphasizes the context of the 1970s for creating the opportunity for Thatcher to pursue not an economic but a moral project aimed at changing the balance between government and the market by challenging the idea that government should always be looked to as the source of solutions to policy problems. Instead, the role of government should be to create the frameworks which would allow citizens to regain control over their economic lives and would make them vigorous and enterprising again, cultivating what Letwin called the vigorous virtues, which he listed as being upright, self-sufficient, energetic, adventurous, independent-minded, loyal to friends, and robust against enemies. For Letwin, Thatcherism meant the recovery of a basic set of conservative values towards the state and the market, which had been buried under an avalanche of collectivism and in which many 
Conservatives had acquiesced. For Ewan Green, the domestic context is still further back. He argues that the post-war settlement in the UK was not really a settlement at all because it was never accepted by the majority of the Conservative Party, as opposed to some of its leaders. There was always, he argues, a significant part of the party which thought, like the novelist Evelyn Waugh, that Britain under the Attlee government was, being, was like being under enemy occupation. Margaret Thatcher was always aligned with this not-so-silent majority in the party, and when the opportunity arose in the 1970s, she emerged as the spokesperson for Conservatives who longed to be rid of everything that had been done in the name of the post-war consensus and restore a much more traditional conservatism, one founded on the vigorous virtues set out by Letwin. The strength of these accounts of Thatcher and Thatcherism is that they make clear how deep-rooted her conservatism was and why on occasion it could conflict with more purist forms of economic liberalism. It is no surprise, perhaps, that Margaret Thatcher was not a libertarian, but it is also true that she was often not an economic liberal, being a strong advocate of intervening in markets in order to protect those she called our people. It is sometimes forgotten that Alfred Roberts, her father, as a grocer in the 1930s, benefited from the protectionist legislation passed by the conservative government of the time, introducing resale price maintenance and restricting competition for many so small self-employed business people, including grocers. Thatcher strongly opposed high interest rates, even when market conditions required them, and also defended mortgage tax relief and other tax breaks for the middle classes because she recognized the political importance of looking after what are now known as the striving classes, or in US parlance, the makers. As a politician, Thatcher was always opposed to the undeserving poor, the shirkers, and the takers, and not averse to using the power of the state to protect and reward the deserving. This points to a deeper truth. Thatcher's political economy was steeped less in neoliberalism than in classical liberalism. She understood instinctively the fundamental structure of the modern political economy as it emerged in the 18th century with its division into economies or households, as Hayek called them, private, corporate, and public households, and then the wider market order. Households could be planned and made orderly, whereas the order of the market was always unplanned and spontaneous. The state, as the main modern expression of the public household, had grown too big, encroaching on both private and corporate households and threatening to undermine the market order itself, the framework within which all these households operated and competed. Ensuring that the state existed to support private and corporate households and allow them to flourish in Adam Smith's and Hayek's great society, the extended market order, that was what Margaret Thatcher's political economy was all about. She encountered many contradictions, some of which she could not resolve, but she remained committed to that key vision. It was one of the sources of her political strength. And just to finish, I'll just quote to you three uh, um, short passages from Thatcher. Um, this from 1968, from a piece in the News of the World where she said, when it comes to economizing, housewives have to because government won't. That's one of her homespun truths. Um, from the 1967 Conservative Party Conference, these are all from uh, before she became Prime Minister, um, or even, in this case, before she became leader of the party. This is the Conservative Party Conference, 1967. She said, freedom has been gained in this country not by great abstract campaigns, but through the objections of ordinary men and women to having their money taken from them by the state. In the early days, people banded together and said to the government, you shall not take our money before you have redressed our grievances. It was their money, their wealth, 
which was the source of their independence against the government. This is crucial. She, of course, is referring there to the English Civil War and the fight against the Crown. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is Margaret Thatcher on the, on the tax state. She says, this is one of her uh, speeches before she became Prime Minister. She says, my first call, therefore, is for a defined role for government. There should be a demarcation between public and private sectors so that both can contribute productively to the mixed economy. Secondly, I believe the proper role of government, if restored, would mean there was the prospect of fashioning a budget that would honestly finance the role of a state. The present role and expenditure of government has produced unacceptable taxation and a horrendous borrowing requirement. And in those uh, three examples, I think you see the lineaments of the political economy which shaped her politics. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Gamble, also for having underlined and explained the, the complexity and the contradictions of Thatcherism in both economy and uh, uh, in economy and uh, I mean uh, in liberalism. Antonio, mh, tu non hai bisogno di presentazioni perché qua diciamo sei, sei l'organizzatore quindi è casa tua e ti lascio la parola per diciamo, la conclusione di questa sessione. Grazie, grazie. Allora il mio intervento sarà in italiano così diamo anche un po' eh, di pausa alle nostre traduttrici dall'inglese e le facciamo lavorare sulla traduzione dall'italiano all'inglese naturalmente. Eh, si, il mio intervento si pone in stretta continuità con il bellissimo intervento del professor Gambo Lora eh, si muove su un piano un po' diverso dai due precedenti perché io guarderò il tacerismo nella prospettiva della filosofia politica quindi eh, spero che mi perdoneranno se farò alcune semplificazioni forse addirittura anche alcune forzature sul tacerismo inteso come fenomeno storico, però la mia convinzione è che studiare il tacerismo dalla prospettiva della teoria politica, oltre che essere la mia disciplina, la teoria politica, e quindi essere questa la motivazione per cui mi sono avvicinato al tacerismo in questa prospettiva, credo che sia profondamente interessante perché la mia idea è che se studiamo il tacerismo con le coordinate di questa disciplina possiamo aprire degli orizzonti estremamente interessanti sia per comprendere il fenomeno stesso del tacerismo sia per fare i conti eh, con alcune questioni riguardanti il liberalismo e il conservatorismo, talvolta anche le frizioni tra queste due teorie politiche, il loro impatto sulla realtà e questo ci può portare forse a fare anche alcune considerazioni sul caso italiano eh, guardato appunto con le lenti del tacerismo. Eh, la Thatcher quando divenne eh, leader del proprio partito, quindi prima di diventare premier, il suo arrivo nel partito alla premiership fu salutato come un'autentica rivoluzione e poi successivamente non deluse le aspettative anche quando divenne premier. Se si parla di rivoluzione il problema è domandarsi che cosa ha cambiato questa rivoluzione. Beh, è una rivoluzione che non ha cambiato le istituzioni della Gran Bretagna. Non ci sono stati cambiamenti importanti nella forma delle istituzioni. Ha cambiato certamente l'economia, ha cambiato i partiti politici, il partito conservatore e il partito laburista. In generale ha cambiato la cultura politica del Paese e anche probabilmente i valori del Paese, che questa era la sua intenzione. Quindi in una chiave di teoria politica la domanda è come è possibile un cambiamento di tale entità in una democrazia e in così pochi anni, se davvero questo cambiamento c'è stato. Quindi in questo senso è un'ideale cartina di tornasole il tacirismo per riflettere anche su qual è l'importanza delle idee, qual è l'importanza della leadership e quindi degli individui, forse anche qual è l'importanza della fortuna in alcuni eventi politici, ma anche qual è l'importanza degli assetti istituzionali che favoriscono o frenano i cambiamenti in una direzione o nell'altra. E poi mi soffermerò su un tema già accennato prima, ossia se si può parlare di ideologia quando si parla di tacerismo. E quindi che cosa c'è di conservatore, che cosa c'è di liberale, se davvero volessimo provare a definire il tacerismo come un'ideologia e che tipo di insegnamento possiamo trarre dal tacerismo per il conservatorismo e per il liberalismo. 
Naturalmente adesso non, non c'è tempo per affrontare in dettaglio la questione, però quando si parla di rivoluzione bisogna capire che cos'era la situazione precedente. Eh, questo cambiamento del clima culturale in cosa è stato? Qui ci potremmo riagganciare al grande e lungo cambiamento del liberalismo britannico. Prima si accennava alla differenza tra il classico liberalismo e il neoliberalismo, beh in mezzo ci sono state tante cose, c'è stato l'utilitarismo di Bentham, c'è stato John Stuart Mill che ha distinto produzione e distribuzione della ricchezza, un autentico spartiacque nella teoria politica liberale, l'idea che si possano tenere distinte queste due dimensioni. E questo poi porta al nuovo liberalismo, al new liberalism, dove ci sono anche degli elementi eh, provenienti eh, dalla Germania, da altre influenze di, di vario tipo, però questo poi porta a consentire, forse a buon diritto, addirittura ai Fabiani, a Keynes, di continuare a definirsi liberali senza che la cosa susciti eh, particolare scalpore. Eh, quindi c'è un grande cambiamento nel liberalismo britannico, nella teoria del liberalismo britannico. Ci sono degli eventi storici che cambiano molto la storia della Gran Bretagna, eh, per citarne soltanto due, la crisi del 29, che porta a un intervento statale maggiore, la, le due guerre mondiali, in particolare la seconda, le guerre mondiali sono sempre degli esperimenti di accentramento nelle mani dello Stato del potere per le necessità belliche, poi però dopo la guerra non si ritorna o si ritorna soltanto parzialmente all'assetto principale. Diciamo, probabilmente la politica non è una scienza, non ha leggi, però una delle eh, poche costanti che possiamo riscontrare è che quando il potere politico aumenta, che poi torni indietro, è molto difficile. I politici sono sempre molto resti a restituire il potere che con una qualunque giustificazione eh, hanno preso. La sfera della politica quando aumenta è molto difficile poi farla tornare indietro. Eh, poi c'è un cambiamento naturalmente nell'assetto partitico perché i laburisti che erano di ispirazione socialista e restarono di ispirazione socialista sino agli anni della Thatcher sostituirono i liberali come importanza come secondo partito e a partire dalla seconda guerra mondiale inizia l'età del welfare consensus che è un consenso molto radicato tra i due principali partiti, i laburisti e i conservatori, su un ampio intervento statale, sull'intervento statale appunto chiunque fosse al governo. Come il partito conservatore giustifica eh, questo welfare consensus, questo favore nei confronti dell'interventismo statale? Beh, dicendo che è un partito pragmatico e non ideologico e ricordando che al proprio interno c'è una corrente paternalistica che è stata sostanzialmente sempre favorevole a un intervento di questo tipo. Quindi ci sono figure chiave come Macmillan, c'è l'idea dietro della crisi ineluttabile del capitalismo e quindi dalla necessità per salvare la democrazia di aumentare l'intervento dello Stato. Quindi è una, un lunghissimo periodo dominato da uno spostamento culturale e eh, anche storico dei compiti di, 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 crescita di crescita dei compiti dello Stato. Beh, il consensus inizia a entrare in crisi in maniera pesante negli anni 60, tant'è che già alla fine degli anni 60 si parla di malattia britannica, a quei tempi era la Gran Bretagna il malato d'Europa, oggi siamo abituati a considerare l'Italia il malato d'Europa. Eh, nel 1970 Edward Heath vince le elezioni con un programma tutto sommato abbastanza liberale, come è stato ricordato, poi dopo due anni fa la celebre U-Turn, una inversione a U abbandonando il tentativo di riformare in senso liberale il sistema britannico proprio per l'opposizione del tacirismo, scusate, del, delle trade unions e dei sindacati naturalmente. Eh, come arriva al potere Margaret Thatcher? Eh, beh, è estremamente interessante vedere anche come arriva al potere all'interno del Partito Conservatore, perché il Partito Conservatore era caratterizzato a quei tempi appunto dalla corrente paternalista, ma anche da una forte leadership, ossia il partito era sempre ampiamente schierato con quello che era il leader che era stato eletto. La Thatcher si pone nella sua battaglia per conquistare il partito come un outsider, come una proposta di minoranza all'interno del partito. Ed era un outsider per tanti motivi, due in particolare. Il primo è che era una donna in un partito ancora fortemente maschilista. Infatti lei non poteva entrare nella smoking room, che non era soltanto la stanza dei fumatori, ma era la stanza dove soltanto gli uomini potevano entrare e decidevano poi quelle che erano eh, le cose importanti del partito. Lei era esclusa dalla smoking room. E poi perché era la figlia di un droghiere, e non aveva eh, 
non solo non aveva origini nobili, ma non, si era, eh, come dire, non aveva acquisito i, nom- i modi quasi aristocratici che comunque avevano a lungo caratterizzato la leadership del Partito Conservatore. Vince grazie ai bank benchers, cioè i parlamentari di secondo piano, meno importanti, una sorta, è stata definita da qualcuno una sorta di rivolta contadina la conquista del potere della Thatcher all'interno del partito. Perché? Come riesce a vincere all'interno del Paese? Beh, anche qui ci sono eventi storici particolarmente importanti, l'inverno dello scontento e alcuni errori di calcolo della leadership da burista prima eh, sono importanti, c'è il dibattito sul declino della Gran Bretagna e quindi la necessità eh, di un cambiamento forte richiesto importante, poi c'è la politica estera che è importantissima con la guerra delle Falkland che è un vero punto di svolta che studia il nostro Domenico Bruni all'interno eh, del, del, di tutta la vicenda taceriana per, per capirla e per garantirgli poi la continuità. Eh, nella battaglia delle idee contro, eh, per, per ribaltare il problema del declino c'è l'idea portata anche dalla vittoria del Falkland, eh, dell'orgoglio dei britannici. Molti britannici erano nati sotto un impero e avevano visto eh, declinare la Gran Bretagna a una potenza di secondo ordine, di secondo rango. E l'idea delle Falkland, che era una, eh, qualcosa di assolutamente marginale per gli interessi britannici, comunque restituisce un orgoglio e dà molto, molta credibilità a quella leadership. Poi c'è anche l'idea che il comunismo, cioè la, 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 l'evidenza che il comunismo stava entrando in crisi e che quindi non era un qualcosa di ineluttabile andare in quella direzione. Quindi ciò che eh, aveva caratterizzato l'età precedente viene un po' meno. Poi c'è il problema, la questione del sistema politico. Qualcuno ha definito la Gran Bretagna una dittatura elettiva, visto i grandi poteri che ha il Premier. Eh, non so se è esattamente così, però sicuramente Margaret Thatcher riuscì a utilizzare in maniera forte il potere di patronage, cioè di eh, sostituire, eh, di cambiare membri importanti all'interno non solo del governo ma anche della burocrazia eh, in maniera consistente. E il sistema maggioritario eh, ebbe un ruolo importante eh, per tanti motivi, perché mh, direi essenzialmente uno, eh, in un sistema proporzionale come quello che a lungo abbiamo avuto in Italia bisogna curarsi attentamente anche delle regioni, dei collegi in cui si perde, perché anche dove si perde si prende qualcosa. Con il sistema maggioritario o si vince o si perde e che si perda di un voto o che si perda del 90% non cambia niente, quello è un seggio perso. Questo consentì alla Thatcher di concentrarsi probabilmente con maggiore attenzione su quelle che erano le aree del paese più ricettive alle sue politiche e di trascurare gli interessi di altre parti come la Scozia e come il Galles in particolare che erano marginali e che subivano forse sicuramente più di altre aree eh, alcune conseguenze delle politiche taceriane. Eh, poi c'è questa crisi del consensus che è anche una crisi, come accennavo prima, culturale, ma a fianco a questo c'è negli anni 60 una rinascita importantissima della teoria politica liberale. Se si guarda gli anni 60, negli anni 60 i liberali del Novecento scrivono le loro opere più importanti, basta pensare a Friedman, basta pensare a Buchanan, eh, Buchanan e Tallock, basta pensare eh, a Hayek naturalmente. E c'è eh, queste nuove idee del liberalismo che fiorivano, che venivano scritte negli anni 60, che acquisivano credibilità anche accademica non solo negli anni 70, grazie a un attento lavoro dei think tank e dei columnist nella Gran Bretagna, riuscirono gradualmente a passare all'interno del dibattito politico. E questo preparò un po' il terreno a quello che era il tacerismo, in particolare l'Institute for Economic Affairs, l'Adam Smith Institute e il Center for Policy Studies, che erano tre think tank importanti, eh, fecero un lavoro importantissimo in questa direzione e io credo che una delle principali difficoltà a cui va incontro oggi la politica italiana è non aver avuto per anni, adesso fortunatamente la situazione sta cambiando anche grazie all'Istituto Bruno Leoni, alla Fondazione Magna Carta e altri think tank 
che si occupano di fare cultura politica e ricerche politiche in maniera consistente, ma uno degli scotti che l'Italia ha pagato e la politica italiana ha pagato è non avere persone che lavoravano sulle idee per preparare i cambiamenti. L'Inghilterra questo lo aveva e negli anni della Thatcher poi ci fu un'accelerazione rispetto a questo processo. Importantissima fu anche la retorica thatcheriana, con la, il famoso acronimo TINA, There is no alternative, ossia questi cambiamenti dobbiamo farli, sono una medicina amara, ma se non li facciamo rischiamo di fare una brutta fine, quindi come un medicinale che per quanto amaro deve essere preso. E poi c'è la strategia comunicativa che è importantissima, perché si è detto che tutte le rivoluzioni si basano sulla capacità di raccontare una storia rispetto al passato. La Thatcher fu abilissima nel raccontare una storia rispetto al passato e questa era prevalentemente una storia negativa era la storia di chi aveva rovinato la Gran Bretagna, ossia la mentalità socialista e i sindacati, le trade unions. Poi successivamente interviene anche quello che potremmo chiamare una sorta di mitologia positiva, ossia il pugno di audaci, naturalmente cappeggiati dalla stessa Thatcher, che cambia la situazione. Però la eh, quasi demonizzazione dell'avversario è, è importantissimo per capire il tacerismo. E da qui arriviamo al problema del se si può definire il tacirismo un'ideologia con il quale il professor Gamble si è già confrontato. Questa domanda ha un fondamento intanto nel fatto che si parla di tacirismo e forse la Thatcher è l'unico importante politico britannico del Novecento ad aver avuto un ismo, un ism dopo il suo cognome. Sì, si parla anche di blairism, ma non è la stessa cosa non come si parla di tacerismo. Eh, e poi la, la, la spiegazione del perché bisogna prendere sul serio la domanda se si tratti di una sorta di ideologia è in un aspetto anche questo già ricordato, ossia che lei stessa dichiara che i suoi intenti non erano economici o non erano prevalentemente economici. Lei diceva l'economia è il metodo, l'obiettivo è cambiare lo spirito della nazione. Quindi l'economia diventa quasi lo strumento per cambiare i valori della nazione. Qui parla di Victorian values, difficile capire esattamente cosa siano, forse erano in realtà delle virtù borghesi più che i valori vittoriani. Eh, lei certo si riferisce alla sua infanzia, a eh, quello che aveva conosciuto, quindi anche al senso della famiglia, della responsabilità, della comunità, però in realtà quello che lei cerca e che vorrebbe realizzare è uno Stato che si limita a dare delle regole di condotta perché poi gli individui possano vivere, eh, perseguire i propri obiettivi senza che ci sia una reale interferenza da parte dello Stato. E la sua idea è che quando vengono meno quei valori che avevano caratterizzato la sua infanzia viene meno la grandezza della Gran Bretagna e si diventa dipendenti dello Stato. Mm? Eh, il problema qui è, ma può davvero lo Stato creare dei valori, ripristinare dei valori? Lo Stato non può inculcare dei valori alla società, creare dei valori che poi la società adotta, però la sua idea era che la crociata contro quello che lei chiamava il nanny state, eh? quindi lo Stato che fa da balia, eh, battendosi contro il nanny state, contro lo Stato balia, si può sconfiggere la mentalità socialista e per questa via riuscire a ripristinare dei valori, quelli che lei chiamava i valori vittoriani. Quindi c'è, e poi accanto a questo c'è un argomento morale a favore del capitalismo, quello che è stato chiamato dai tacceriani il popular capitalism. La Thatcher dice che la grande eh, vittoria, la grande battaglia dell'Ottocento è, è, è stata quella di dare il voto a tutti i cittadini, la grande battaglia dei giorni nostri di oggi è restituire il potere al popolo. Restituire il potere al popolo lo si fa togliendo il potere a una classe dirigente, a una classe politica che aveva spogliato il popolo del proprio potere e delle sue proprietà. E quindi questo lo si fa privatizzando, restituendo le imprese e i beni che erano della nazione britannica e che venivano gestiti per i propri interessi da quelli che erano i politici che se ne erano appropriati. Quindi, e la sua idea poi era creare una sorta di nazione di proprietari. E qui eh, c'è il libro della Letwin che è già stato citato, che è importante, che ci mostra come la Thatcher faccia una sorta di equazione tra libertà, proprietà e responsabilità. E in base a questa equazione si possono leggere eh, molte delle sue riforme, molte delle sue battaglie. Ad esempio, 
quando privatizza le imprese, queste imprese vengono privatizzate a dei piccoli azionisti, non al miglior offerente, ma l'idea era proprio dare ai piccoli azionisti che passano da 3 a 11 milioni, una cosa importantissima e cambia probabilmente eh, la visione del mercato che hanno molte persone che diventano piccoli azionisti perché acquistano una parte delle delle imprese mh, privatizzate e la Thatcher non mancò di mettere in luce la dimensione morale di questa operazione che aveva fatto. La stessa cosa si può dire per la privatizzazione delle case che furono vendute anche qui non al miglior offerente ma alle persone che ci stavano dentro a dei prezzi eh, bassi, non dei prezzi di mercato. Questo perché l'idea era che diventare proprietari della casa in cui si vive eh, aumenta la responsabilità nei confronti della famiglia l'avere una proprietà da conferisce dei valori, che non è un'idea soltanto tacceriana, ma è un'idea nella quale lei credeva molto. E alla fine la stessa battaglia contro i sindacati può essere letta in questa chiave, perché allora esisteva una regola effettivamente eh, un po' strana e difficile da giustificare, per la quale sostanzialmente se volevi cercare un lavoro dovevi essere iscritto a un sindacato. L'iscrizione al sindacato era obbligatorio, sostanzialmente. E la sua battaglia era l'idea che l'adesione deve essere volontaria a qualunque tipo di associazione, a un partito politico come un sindacato, come a qualunque altra cosa. Quindi anche qui c'è una dimensione morale nella battaglia ai sindacati che è molto importante. Tutto questo basta definire il tacirismo come un'ideologia? No, credo di no, anche per quello che è stato detto nella prima sessione, ossia la Thatcher fu un politico indubbiamente coerente, con un set di valori molto chiaro e molto determinato, ma sarebbe un errore studiarla come se fosse un filosofo. Lei stessa capì molto gradualmente quali erano le implicazioni morali delle sue scelte, agiva istintivamente, poi realizzava che c'erano delle implicazioni morali e filosofiche, se preferite, nelle sue scelte e le faceva proprie. Lesse dei libri sicuramente che diedero una sorta di rispettabilità di fondo e dei valori di fondo alla sua azione, lei fu estremamente abile e intelligentissima nel trovare delle, da un lato dal, delle implicazioni pratiche dalle teorie generali dei libri che leggeva. Poi è vero che non fu un intellettuale come magari era Joseph, ma la sua leadership ebbe un enorme impatto intellettuale un grandissimo impatto intellettuale, e seppe usare le idee come strumenti politici. Pensate ad esempio a quello che abbiamo detto prima sul declino. Beh, però questa sua grande determinazione per seguire i propri intenti, queste sue scelte che sembravano quasi ideologiche, in realtà, se ci trasferiamo appunto sul piano della teoria politica, fanno emergere tutta una serie di quelli che io ho chiamato i paradossi del taccerismo. Quali sono questi paradossi? C'è un punto preliminare, che è questo, un problema preliminare, ossia se il free market, che la Thatcher ha ripristinato in Inghilterra, il libero mercato, abbia veramente portato a dei valori vittoriani o cos'altro, oppure al materialismo, che non è una domanda semplice a cui rispondere. Ad esempio David Cameron eh, oggi accusa il taccerismo di aver portato a un materialismo e di non aver ripristinato i valori che in realtà si proponeva di, di, di ripristinare. Poi la domanda, che è una delle grandi domande della filosofia politica, pensate ad esempio a Nietzsche, è se possiamo davvero fondare i valori su qualcosa di diverso dalla religione. Poi ci sarebbe una provocazione ulteriore che uno potrebbe dire, beh, è un approccio molto marxista, cambiamo la struttura per cambiare la sovrastruttura, ossia cambiamo i rapporti economici per poi cambiare i valori. Quindi si potrebbe addirittura aprire uno scenario di interpretazione marxiana eh, riguardo alla taccia. Non mi spingo così oltre, diciamo mi sono limitato a mettere sul piatto questi problemi, questo punto zero dei nostri paradossi. Invece il primo paradosso sul quale mi vorrei soffermare forse lo possiamo chiamare il paradosso della democrazia, ossia l'idea della Thatcher era che bisognava ritrovare per il governo eh, il perseguimento del bene comune ossia il governo estaggio delle lobby per anni non era più in grado di ricercare il bene della nazione britannica, ma andava eh, dietro eh, il tentativo di soddisfare delle diverse lobby e perdeva di vista quello che era appunto il, il bene comune della società. Questo è un problema di tutte le democrazie moderne, che sono spesso ostaggio delle lobby e che non riescono a fare le proprie riforme proprio perché sono ostaggio delle lobby. E la soluzione che ci propone la Thatcher in realtà sembra essere un po' la soluzione di un liberale conservatore, 
che ci ha ricordato già nel titolo il professor Gambo nel suo libro, sia riduciamo i compiti dello Stato per migliorare l'economia, per farla funzionare, e eh, così al contempo diamo più autorevolezza allo Stato. Free economy and strong state. Quindi anche qui restituire il potere al popolo, quello che avevamo detto prima, potere che gli era stato sottratto dal nanny state. Il problema è come lei, Margaret Thatcher, herself, persegue questo obiettivo. Se si analizza la sua leadership ci si rende conto che lei era un leader fideisticamente convinto quasi delle battaglie che portava avanti ed era un leader che pensava di sapere soltanto lei cosa la gente voleva, di cosa la nazione britannica aveva effettivamente bisogno. E poi il professor Weinen ci ha mostrato che la realtà era più complicata, però era un leader che credeva solo in se stesso. E infatti il numero di persone che furono cacciate o che si dimisero per frizioni con la taccia era un numero elevatissimo. Eh, e lei cercava quasi una relazione speciale direttamente con il popolo. Questo lo si può vedere anche nel rapporto con i media, nei suoi discorsi, in cui effettivamente si rivolgeva direttamente alla nazione britannica più che al suo partito. Gli elementi, il perché, questo lo si può spiegare anche con le frizioni che aveva avuto nel partito per tanti, in tanti modi. Però alla fine la conclusione a cui si arriva è che quello della Thatcher era effettivamente un governo di un leader unico, che si che si, si intende se stesso come unico interprete della volontà popolare. E questo può sconfinare quasi in una sorta di giacobinismo, potremmo dire, il leader che incarna la volontà popolare. Forse può essere una provocazione, ma la categoria del giacobinismo applicata al tacerismo è qualcosa che eh, può suscitare un qualche interesse. Il secondo paradosso, quindi il primo è questo di ricercare il bene comune e poi andare a finire in una sorta di rapporto privilegiato col popolo e con il giacobinismo. Il secondo paradosso è quello che potremmo chiamare il paradosso del conservatorismo e del liberalismo. I governi di Margaret Thatcher furono dei governi estremamente, appunto si parla di rivoluzione, quindi furono dei governi molto attivi, molto intrusivi quasi all'interno della società, quasi una pianificazione a favore del libero mercato, un utilizzo forte della politica e dello Stato per ripristinare le regole del libero mercato. Questo avvenne soprattutto con la lotta alle trade unions all'inizio, ma poi successivamente avvenne anche spazzando via il local government e centralizzando nello Stato tutta una serie di compiti che prima erano delocalizzati all'interno della Gran Bretagna. Quindi si pensi alla scuola, all'amministrazione della giustizia, alla sanità, alla stessa polizia. C'è un processo di accentramento durante il periodo tacceriano. Potremmo forse dire, forzando un po', ma neanche troppo, che spazza via i corpi intermedi, quelli che nella tradizione eh, del, dell'analisi storico-politica vengono definiti corpi intermedi. Eh, questo ovviamente da, con le categorie del conservatorismo è qualcosa che stona un po', il conservatorismo per definizione è contrario ai cambiamenti improvvisi e radicali, e il suo fu un cambiamento improvviso e radicale. Al contrario anche alla teoria liberale, che l'idea è che meno lo Stato fa meglio è, e invece lei utilizzò in maniera fortissima eh, lo strumento dello Stato, è un fenomeno appunto di accentramento eh, nel governo centrale dei compiti dello Stato. Beh, questa è una contraddizione forse filosofica, ma per lei politico non era una contraddizione. L'idea è che, era bis che bisognava tornare a una situazione precedente che era stata eh, eliminata, che quindi bisognava tornare ai vecchi valori come a una vecchia organizzazione della società diversa e eh, per questo cambiamento non si poteva che utilizzare lo Stato, non si poteva che utilizzare la politica per tornare indietro rispetto a questo cambiamento. Però il problema teorico rimane, ossia si può realizzare una società liberale e conservatrice con metodi che non sono né liberali né conservatori? Serve una forte leadership nel momento in cui la società non si sa riformare da sola e può un cambiamento di questo tipo essere un cambiamento durevole, un cambiamento realizzato dallo Stato nell'arco di un decennio sostanzialmente, può essere un cambiamento durevole. Beh, questi paradossi sono interessanti, vanno forse analizzati meglio, per alcuni aspetti stemperati e per alcuni aspetti arricchiti.
da alcune considerazioni. La prima considerazione è una che è stata già sviluppata eh, nel, in quello che ho detto in precedenza, ossia eh, i valori e il free market eh, va bene, però la Thatcher fu un ingrediente essenziale, perché senza di lei il cambiamento non ci sarebbe stato, ma non unico. Per alcuni aspetti lei è il frutto della battaglia delle idee, è il frutto maturo della battaglia delle idee, quindi dietro c'era un percorso comunque più, più lungo, più importante. Quindi da sola non è sufficiente a spiegare il cambiamento che avviene all'interno della politica britannica, va inquadrata all'interno di quella che è stata la battaglia delle idee. Quindi i think tank le diedero indubbiamente strategie di policy su come affrontare questo cambiamento, ma nel far passare negli anni le idee liberali diedero anche una diversa visione del mercato, che non era più il luogo dello sfruttamento eh, del periodo vittoriano e quant'altro, ma era un luogo di opportunità, dove era possibile realizzare appunto, le proprie ambizioni e i propri obiettivi. Eh, e in questo senso la TACE si inserisce in un cambiamento culturale che stava gradualmente avvenendo e lei dà una spinta propulsiva, quindi diventa lei stessa un ingrediente di quella, la, di quella battaglia delle idee estremamente importante. Senza, la Thatcher, senza il tacerismo non ci sarebbe stata, il, la Thatcher non ci sarebbe stata senza, ci sarebbe stata la Thatcher ma non ci sarebbe stato il tacerismo se non ci fosse stata la battaglia delle idee. Però la battaglia delle idee non, sarebbe stata, non si sarebbe vinta se non ci fosse stata Margaret Thatcher con le sue caratteristiche e con la sua personalità. Quindi insomma è un insegnamento anche su quanto contino le idee nell'evoluzione storica ma anche su quanto contino gli individui e anche quanto conti la fortuna. Abbiamo visto le Falkland e tutti gli altri eventi estremamente importanti. Riguardo il secondo paradosso, quello che abbiamo chiamato un po' provocatoriamente il paradosso del giacobinismo, che forse potremmo chiamare il paradosso del, liberismo, del liderismo, scusate. Eh, beh, vabbè, intanto va messo a fuoco che naturalmente se proviamo a parlare di giacobinismo ci riferiamo al metodo e non agli obiettivi, non alla sostanza. Quindi era un po' una provocazione in questo senso. Però, mi sembra che questo problema, il problema del liderismo, appunto, colga quella che è una difficoltà del liberalismo oggi. Perché? Perché il liberalismo è una teoria della limitazione del potere. Ha sviluppato strumenti costituzionali, eh, modelli di ordine politico e sociale che giustificano la limitazione dello Stato. Però oggi il problema non è soltanto come limitare il potere dello Stato. Oggi il problema è come tornare indietro rispetto a uno Stato che è andato troppo avanti, che è cresciuto troppo. E sul come tornare indietro il liberalismo non ha una teoria, non ha una ricetta che si può dire il liberalismo ci dice che si può tornare indietro in questo modo. Il costituzionalismo sostanzialmente ha fallito, ci dice Hayek, in Law, Legislation and Liberty, nel contenere il potere statale. Allora una volta che c'è stato questo fallimento e che lo Stato comunque si è ingigantito nel corso degli anni, questo è un dato uh, difficile da non riconoscere perché basta guardare a qual è la percentuale di ricchezza che gestisce lo Stato oggi rispetto a cent'anni fa o cinquant'anni fa, quant'è il numero dei dipendenti statali oggi rispetto a quanto era vent'anni fa. Può essere un processo che piace, non, sto dicendo, non lo sto valutando negativamente, sto dicendo che da un punto di vista liberale è innegabile constatare che c'è stata una crescita esponenziale dei compiti dello Stato e che quindi da un punto di vista liberale il problema sia come tornare indietro rispetto a questo. Beh, rispetto a questo, come tornare indietro rispetto a uno Stato che è cresciuto troppo, guardare alla leadership e guardare all'esempio storico di Margaret Thatcher dà degli elementi importanti di riflessione. Questo sicuramente. E credo che un autore su cui il liberalismo dovrebbe riflettere, che può portare un po' forse nuova linfa a questo tipo di riflessione, forse stupisce un po', ma è Foucault che nel suo trattato sulla biopolitica, che in realtà è un libro sul liberalismo, ci dice che lo Stato liberale vuole ridurre se stesso i propri compiti per essere uno Stato forte, che funziona bene, che soddisfa le esigenze dei cittadini, e ci dice anche che lo Stato liberale ha bisogno di un tipo umano ben definito, che non con tutti gli uomini puoi avere uno Stato liberale. E qui si pone il problema del cosa si può fare per avere questo tipo di uomini e quindi per avere una società effettivamente liberale. Insomma, comunque vogliamo vedere la cosa, bisogna ammettere che il tacerismo è un grande, 
eh, insegnamento, o meglio non insegnamento, un grande caso di studio eh, affinché il liberalismo e anche il conservatorismo eh, tornino a riflettere su almeno tre punti, che direi sono il potere delle idee, l'importanza anche dei meccanismi istituzionali che consentono o frenano i cambiamenti all'interno della società, e questo è un punto particolarmente delicato per l'Italia, ma anche l'aspetto che abbiamo chiamato prima, che discende dal giacobinismo e che possiamo chiamare forse liberismo, nel liderismo, eh, e che potremmo definire in fondo il problema del primato della politica, ossia della necessità del, di usare la politica per ridurre la politica. Grazie. Grazie Antonio. Abbiamo ancora un po' di tempo, quindi se ci sono delle domande le possiamo raccogliere. Prego. Facciamo così, scusate. Io avevo semplicemente tre punti, eh, farò lavorare anch'io i nostri traduttori e mi scuso con i nostri speaker, ma è più carino forse eh, fare le domande nella lingua della platea. Per così dire. Il primo punto è, è una ragione di stupore, Io sono, credo di avervi ascoltato abbastanza attentamente e sono rimasto stupito dal fatto che non sia entrata nella vostra discussione la parola nazionalismo. Forse perché la nostra discussione è stata in realtà per la più parte eh, britannica, ma indubbiamente se noi avessimo avuto un panel composto in grado maggiore di studiosi italiani, un elemento di leadership nazionalistica della Thatcher sarebbe stato portato alla discussione, anche perché c'è una grande differenza tra i nostri paesi sotto quel profilo. Ehm, Avrei poi due domande che vanno a incrociare soprattutto le ultime due eh, relazioni. Io ho trovato la relazione del professor Gamble assolutamente illuminante per alcuni Grazie. degli elementi che ha portato. Mi è parso molto illuminante anche questa idea di leggere, eh, diciamo così, l'istintiva comprensione dell'economia classica da parte della signora Thatcher come per l'appunto un appartenere a una tradizione che non è quella del liberalismo del secondo dopoguerra, insomma, ma è casomai la tradizione del liberalismo classico del secolo precedente. Ecco, ehm, la tradizione del liberalismo classico in Inghilterra si intreccia potentemente e come dire non, non passa anche nel, nel momento in cui filtra eh, a livello popolare, tra virgolette, passa solo dalla lettura su larga scala della ricchezza delle nazioni, ma passa da tante dimensioni. Una di queste è il dissenso religioso, è il non conformismo. Se non sbaglio la signora Thatcher era di famiglia metodista e volevo chiedere se c'è evidenza insomma, di un'importanza particolare della sua educazione, della storia religiosa della sua famiglia rispetto a questa visione evocata nella prima delle tre Uh, citazione finale nella relazione di Gamble che atteneva appunto la separatezza del ruolo uh, dello Stato e di quello del, dell'economia o della società. L'ultimo punto, anche qui eh, eh, Gamble ha fatto una considerazione estremamente interessante soprattutto alla luce di quanto poi si diceva delle virtù vittoriane, cioè lui ha ricordato che la signora Thatcher è sempre stata tendenzialmente opposta a alti uh, tassi di interesse che è controintuitivo dalla prospettiva dell'enfasi no, sulla virtù vittoriane. Nello stesso tempo eh, sia Vinen che Bale hanno evocato il tema del monetarismo e di un suo eh, tendenziale fallimento all'interno del, del dibattito pubblico. Una delle grandi ragioni eh, dell'anti-europeismo tacceriano, per come ce lo ricordiamo oggi, è l'opposizione all'euro e all'idea di una banca centrale europea che se vogliamo è l'idea monetarista per eccellenza, insomma, no? la separazione più radicale che possa esserci tra eh, la politica monetaria da una parte e la politica nazionale eh, dall'altra. Ecco, ero interessato a questo punto a capire da loro come avviene questo cambiamento anche a livello di comunicazione. Si capisce che un leader politico volitivo eh, e, um, come dire, um, 
decisionista, come veniva ricordato molto bene prima anche nella densa relazione di Antonio Masala, non ami l'idea di una banca centrale indipendente, questo eh, è piuttosto eh, chiaro a comprendersi, ma volevo sapere come eh, cambia questa cosa a livello di comunicazione pubblica, insomma come si passa da una retorica critica rispetto alla gestione diciamo così, del, del consenso keynesiano, questo forse è il termine appropriato della moneta, invece a un, a un neonazionalismo monetario, insomma all'opposizione all'artificio più complesso che è in armonia però con l'idea di una costituzione monetaria, indipendenza della banca centrale, eccetera. riuniformo a questo punto alle tradizioni, va bene, quindi parlerò in italiano. E ho ascoltato con molta attenzione eh, tutti gli interventi che sono stati fatti questo pomeriggio e su, sul, ciascuno, e in particolare su quello del professor Wein e del professor Gombo. Antonio, io vorrei fare... Riguardo all'intervento del professor Wein, sono rimasto molto colpito dal assenza di riferimento nel suo intervento ma anche nel suo libro ai valori conservatori che eh, animavano il dibattito in Gran Bretagna e soprattutto eh, ai valori conservatori che fanno parte di una tradizione culturale molto viva e che però poi c'è stato un po' di rompimento all'interno eh, di quello che sono eh, le linee politiche costruite dal partito conservatore a livello politico, valori parlo in termini filosofici, non in termini eh, di eh, azioni politiche. Eh, mi chiedo se eh, questi valori fossero stati, a suo giudizio, nell'operato della TAC, era estremamente importante, ma eh, invece è appartito da questo. Non arriva all'interno. Mi chiedevo se, mi chiedevo se questo, a suo giudizio questi valori conservatori non sono costitutivi di una idea di taccerismo che è apparsa a mio giudizio nel suo uh, intervento più legata ad elementi di natura come dire, storico-empirica che non di eh, carattere ideologico, mentre sembrerebbe, almeno dalla mia lettura di quel periodo, che questi valori conservatori abbiano avuto un ruolo importante nel costruire una visione dell'intervento eh, della Thatcher che ha una caratterizzazione diciamo quasi ideologica in un certo senso. Questa mia domanda è diventata tanto più pressante una volta ascoltato l'intervento del professor Gamble che enfatizza l'aspetto dei valori conservatori e mi trovo in questo senso molto eh, d'accordo ehm, e fa riferimento in particolare ad un punto che ho trovato molto interessante relativo alle circostanze che hanno consentito alla Thatcher di realizzare le politiche che ha realizzato, distingue il professor Gamble ehm, ehm, delle circostanze internazionali e delle circostanze interne, ma quando parla delle circostanze interne, in una situazione in un certo senso quasi speculare rispetto a quella in, eh, osservata nella relazione precedente, fa meno riferimento agli aspetti di natura fattuale. Ora, sembra a me invece che nel momento in cui la Thatcher prende il potere, stiamo parlando della fine degli anni 70 e inizio degli anni 80, l'intero mondo occidentale si trova a vivere una circostanza estremamente particolare, forse della quale quel mondo non era ancora consapevole, soprattutto alla luce... Eh, noi questo lo possiamo leggere oggi, soprattutto alla luce delle recenti ricerche che sono state fatte all'interno della storia economica sull'andamento dei rendimenti in termini di produttività delle innovazioni. E secondo, per esempio, Robert Gordon, in quel periodo i rendimenti della, della produttività, cioè la produttività del, derivante dall'incremento dell'innovazione verificatasi nel, nei, negli 80 anni precedenti, erano decrescenti. Questo aspetto secondo me ha influenzato in qualche modo, se, non so sino a che punto in maniera consapevole, ma ha influenzato in qualche modo l'azione di eh, governo della Thatcher e mi chiedevo se a suo giudizio effettivamente ci sono tracce di questa influenza e se è, è riscontrabile effettivamente eh, nell'operato di governo della Thatcher eh, una consapevolezza di cambiamento di circostanze storiche oltre che di adesione a certi tipi di valori. Infine, l'ultima considerazione la volevo fare con riferimento all'intervento di Antonio Masala, nel quale ehm, trovo una 
aspetto estremamente pericoloso um, dal punto di vista liberale, cioè l'idea che si possa riformare lo Stato in senso liberale attraverso una leadership forte. Io trovo questa una cosa che è estremamente rischiosa, c'è un dibattito molto diffuso nel mondo anche liberale di ricorso a fattori esterni per risolvere le illiberalità dei sistemi nei quali in questo momento ci dibattiamo anche nel nostro paese e la mia impressione è sempre stata quella che i rischi connessi a questi percorsi fossero di gran lunga maggiore dei potenziali benefici che questi percorsi ehm, possano effettivamente generare oltre al fatto ma su questo non so esprimere un giudizio perché non sono uno storico oltre al fatto che io non sono nemmeno sicuro che effettivamente ehm, si possa attribuire alla Thatcher un disegno storico preciso di desiderio di riformare in senso liberale uno Stato attraverso percorsi in qualche modo di, eh, diciamo così, di, eh, tu hai chiamato giacobinisti, esattamente. Quindi questo è un aspetto storico sul quale non mi so, eh, non mi so eh, esprimere, però ti chiedo se tu non veda e come tu pensi che possano essere corretti gli eventuali rischi connessi ad, ad, al percorso di giacobinisti di cui hai parlato. Grazie. Raccogliamo se c'è un'ultima domanda. C'era prima il signore. <ride> Prego. I just wanted to um, say a couple of words really in support of what Andrew Gamble said, that um, uh, Mrs. Thatcher was not in any uh, real way a, a libertarian. She was remarkably pragmatic and, and conservative in, in many respects. Uh, for example, she was against, uh, throughout her premiership, the privatization of the post office because she believed that this was some kind of special uh, institution which had a special relationship with both the state uh, and the crown. She was uh, against uh, independence for central banks, as Albert, Alberto Mingardi has just uh, uh, indicated. She was actually extremely cautious if you talk to Geoffrey Howe on the issue of... Um, the repeal of exchange controls. She apparently said to Geoffrey Howe, um, yes, go ahead, do it, be it on your own head. And, um, but it was, as, as it happens, a very important move because without the repeal of exchange controls and with the development of North Sea oil, the pound sterling could have risen much more dramatically and had a much greater effect on manufacturing industry than it, than it did um, in, in practice. Um, but she faced some very particular problems. Um, the extent of trade union power, uh, incredibly high uh, marginal tax rates, which would really not been seen before in peacetime, and also the size of the nationalized sector, which in Britain had reached the kind of levels which only really existed elsewhere in the world in South America, and inflation rates which were moving towards um, those levels uh, as well. And I, um, I th her, her radicalism, I, I, I think, is perhaps better seen as a determination to deal with those problems which she saw as uh, undermining the fabric of British society. If you look at the components of government spending under Mrs. Thatcher, uh, government spending did not reduce all that dramatically uh, at, at all. And indeed, in only one sector, that is support for the nationalized industries, uh, did it really um, reduce um, at all. Uh, j just one other point, because the, the issue of the uh, paradox, the contradiction bet uh, perhaps between liberalism and centralization has been um, mentioned. Mrs. Thatcher uh, centralized power in order to, uh, in, in some respects, and undermine the uh, local government and uh, other institutions within society in order to try to promote a, a, um, a reform and, and liberalism. This paradox still exists within the current government. You, you have, for example, Michael Gove, who on the one hand is trying to, uh, as education secretary, to promote greater, greater freedom in education, uh, but on the other hand, he is taking uh, more action to centralize control of uh, curriculum and examining and, and so on. And so this paradox between centralization and, um, and trying to promote radical reform and, and, and liberalism is something which I, I think has really uh, infected the Conservative or, or, or been a problem for the Conservative Party uh, ever since um, Mrs. Thatcher's time and, and still is today. <laughs>
Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, if I didn't mention nationalism, then that's certainly very remiss of me, because I think nationalism is always present in Thatcherism. I think nationalism changes over time, though, so that partly economic decline is seen in very nationalistic terms. I mean, there are a variety of reasons why one might dislike economic decline, but one of the reasons why Thatcher dislikes it is because she sees it as a matter of national prestige. So the kind of decline she's talking about is always very self-consciously a relative decline. Uh, I think, though, in the early stages of Thatcherism, of course, the Cold War also means that Britain has to think of itself very much in terms of international entities. And I think one of the thing features of the end of the Cold War is Thatcher's increasing sense that there can be a kind of revival of a, a British nationalism. Um, someone asked me, I think it was a question addressed to me, um, whether I think Thatcher's a conservative, uh, to which the answer is yes. Um, I think she's a conservative in the purely party sense, in that uh, we forget how much the party system was under challenge in Britain in the 1970s, how many people thought the party system was going to break down. In some ways, Thatcher's actually, I think, the person who saves the Conservative Party at that stage, who says no, no agreement with other parties um, will keep a kind of institutional focus on the Conservative Party. In terms of uh, an ideological heritage of conservatism, I mean, she's clearly a conservative in lots of ways, uh, alluded to by Andrew. Uh, I think she's a less kind of historically conscious conservative than some of her colleagues. There is obviously in Thatcherism, which I think, as I say, is a, uh, a mix of different things. There are people who think of themselves as very strong traditional conservatives. Uh, my own feeling, uh, which I suspect is an unpopular feeling uh, in this room, is that we probably overstate the search for kind of ideological coherence in Thatcherism, and I think that's true on both sides. I mean, I think if you look at the two kind of extremes of think tankery, interpretation of Thatcher, say Morris Cowling and Alfred Sherman. Um, those are very different kinds of people. Morris Cowling would represent the very self-conscious, traditional Salisbury group type of conservatism, an emphasis upon uh, the importance of the Anglican church, uh, a skepticism about you know, the improvability of human nature, those kind of things. Um, I think uh, both those currents, though, probably have less influence on Thatcherite policy and ministers um, than those people might desire. I think it's important to stress a break between Thatcherism in power and Thatcherism out of power. So I think it's easy to look at the opposition period when think tanks are important, when discussion of ideas is important, 75 to 79. And also, of course, there's Thatcher's period when she loses power, when I think there's also a certain kind of rethinking of what she thinks herself Thatcherism might have meant. But I think that's rather different from what Thatcherism meant when it was in power, especially during those crucial few years. I think there's a kind of crucial period from 79 to 83 as the Thatcherites confront the realities of power. I also think in terms of liberalism, conservatism, it's a bit of a false debate. And this is a point that Nigel Lawson addresses very specifically when he talks about the nature of Thatcherism early in the Thatcher government when he says the whole point about 19th century British politics is that in certain respects about economics, the two parties actually agreed with each other. Now, Nigel Lawson is obviously a key figure in terms of Thatcherite economic policy. You might say, uh, in certain respects, he's a liberal, but he's someone who very emphatically thinks of himself as a conservative. I mean, the key reference point for Nigel Lawson is Disraeli, not Gladstone, but he argues that in 19th century terms, there wasn't necessarily a sharp um, division between the economic policies or the economic philosophies of the two sides. Can, can I um, just address this um, Jacobinism point, actually? And, and it's not, not a, um, uh, a word that we, we use so much, um, perhaps in England, but I mean, we, we do and are, are particularly concerned with at the moment use the, the term populism. Um, and I think analysing Margaret Thatcher um, as a populist, which was very fashionable, I have to say, in the 1980s, and partly because Gramsci <laughs> uh, was, was so fashionable on the left uh, in, in the UK in, in the 1980s, um, is, is a worthwhile project. And I, I, I think um, in some ways to understand that is to understand what she 
um, did to the Conservative Party in many ways, which wasn't, um, I think, wholly positive. Um, I mean, I think which is right to say that in some ways she saved the Conservative Party possibly in the 1970s. But I think one aspect of her legacy that we haven't dealt with, and um, it, it's a, an interest of, of mine, obviously, because I'm so interested in the Conservative Party, is, is the legacy um, she left um, the party. Um, you know, that in some ways can be interpreted very negatively. Um, there's the electoral legacy that she left behind. Um, which has to do with the inability of the party now to um, win in, in Scotland or win significant seats in Scotland, um, its inability to win uh, many seats in um, Wales, its complete inability to win any seats in um, urban areas, particularly in, in northern England. Um, so she, in, in some ways, uh, hollowed out its electoral support. Um, but I think she also um, damaged um, the authority... Um, of uh, Conservative Party leaders, ironically, not just because um, of what she did to her successor, John Major, but also because, in some ways, Mrs Thatcher's style was to run against her own um, government um, and to run even, to some extent, against her, her own party and to um, go back to something that somebody said in the questioning um, uh, and also something that um, Antonio raised. Um, she claimed to have a kind of direct line to the British people that went above and, and beyond party. Um, and I think that model is, is something that um, uh, has done a great deal of, of damage, I think, to the authority of um, Conservative Party leaders who can't possibly um, mimic her ability, I think, to, to appeal to the, to the base, as it were, outside um, uh, of, of, of Parliament. And what we have now is a situation where, um, you know, leadership in the Conservative Party or for the Conservative Party is very, very problematic. And many MPs, I think, find it very difficult um, to be led now, partly because um, they, uh, they, they have no respect for um, authority, hierarchy, etc. And the reason that they have no respect for hierarchy or authority, I mean, there, there are various reasons, but um, it, it has partly to do with the fact that um, Mrs. Thatcher set up this model of a kind of charismatic um, outsider um, rather than a kind of consummate insider whose authority derives from his or her um, position which I think has made the Conservative Party in some ways um, uh, almost an unleadable party and has tempted, I think, many Conservatives, natural Conservatives, to look at other leaders. Nigel Farage is a very good example, the UKIP leader, and see in him, in some ways, um, the, the kind of um, Thatcherite outsider um, that they long for. So, I mean, I think she's, she's done damage to the Conservative Party electorally. I think she's done damage... Um, to the Conservative Party in terms of the kind of um, paradigm of leadership um, she's established. And to go back to, to one other thing, and here I'll finish, I, I do think that she's made the Conservative Party a much less, um, if you like, flexible uh, and pragmatic institution than it once was. I think it's absolutely true to say that she herself in her earlier days was a, a pragmatic and a, and a flexible politician. She lost that pragmatism, she lost that flexibility over time, her legacy has been interpreted by so many people who lack that flexibility and pragmatism themselves. It's hardened into a kind of uh, zealotry, if you like, and it has turned the Conservative Party into a sect rather than a broad church. And I think that um, poses problems for its ability to govern Britain uh, with a majority um, into the future. Um, there's lots of interesting points, but I'll just pick up um, a, a couple. The, the, the first one about uh, Margaret Thatcher's relationship to dissent, um, the dissenting religious tradition in the UK. I think there's no doubt that um, um, the, the, the background from which she came and the... the uh, the politics of her father, that he was originally a liberal, and, and certainly in the 19th century, he would have been very obviously a, uh, a liberal, 
Uh, John Vincent's very fine book on the 19th century British Liberal Party, um, Alfred Roberts would have fitted exactly into uh, um, that, uh, that culture, that tradition. Of course, what happened in the 20th century was a large part of that liberal uh, party, that old liberal base, moved into the Conservative Party for particular historical reasons to do with the rise of the labor movement and, 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 and socialism. But I think what is interesting is that, uh, to emphasize, is the way in which um, Thatcher drew a great deal upon that dissenting uh, tradition um, and, and the way that that, uh, that made her an, an outsider in relation to many of the dominant elites, the traditional elites of British society. So that although she, uh, um, um, she, she, she scaled the heights of, of political power, she always thought of herself as an outsider, and this was both, I think, it's, it comes from those sources, also, of course, the fact that she was a woman, and uh, the fact that she had this remarkable career as a, as a, um, a, as a woman politician, uh, and, and to succeed within the Conservative Party um, was, uh, uh, was, was an extraordinary, um, Achievement. So I, I do think that's a very important aspect of her um, of her career. And of course, it, it, it goes. It takes you back in British political culture and British political history. It does give uh, Thatcher a direct line back to um, all the, uh, um, the, the 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 dissenting traditions of the. Uh, going back into the 17th century. And, and that's the quotation I, 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 I uh, one of the quotes I used um, shows, she was very alive to that uh, resistance in the, in the 17th century in Britain to the, uh, to, to the crown, to an over mighty crown and to the people uh, demanding liberty from, uh, um, uh, from taxation. So I think that's an important part of Margaret Thatcher's basic outlook. And the other point I want to pick up, which connects, uh, connects the two other questions that, um, uh, qu questioners who uh, raised points, is, is about inflation. I, th I think it's absolutely right that inflation and the conquest of inflation, um, uh, I, it, we, we, we need to emphasize how important that was in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, for all British politicians, but also, of course, much more widely for politicians across the, uh, um, the Western world. And the, the conquest of inflation at that time, uh, the, the, the dissolution of the, uh, um, the old uh, Keynesian political economy, the, 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 the contradictions which emerged within it, um, meant that the conquest of inflation became a primary political goal. And there were different uh, ways of, of, of dealing with it. Monetarism was one set of ideas for tackling it. But that, that became the imperative for politicians like Margaret Thatcher. Um, I think that, that explains a lot of the uh, um, uh, a, a lot of her motivation, both in relation to um, trade unions and public spending and, 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 and borrowing and so on. And it connects to this broader point that the 1970s was a period of very substantial slowdown in economic growth. It's, it's a big problem about uh, productivity and the, the, uh, there was a, 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 a generalized recession malaise throughout the Western world, it, the crisis wasn't as severe as it's been since 2008, but it was still um, a very significant period of restructuring across the Western economies. And, I, um, and the, the, the solutions which emerged um, with the, um, with the d assistance from the uh, uh, leadership from the Americans was for a, for, for a new, much more liberalized international economy in which, which took shape in the 1980s and, and, and 1990s. 
and, that, and I think Thatcherism fits absolutely into that, uh, um, in, 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 into that context as, as related to particular British circumstances, but nevertheless um, part of a more general trend, which you can trace in the responses in other countries as well. Thank you. Antonio, se vuoi concludere e sì, presentare molto, poi molto il molto velocemente. Beh, insomma, il richiamo sul nazionalismo fatto da Alberto Mingarti prima, sì, credo che sia importantissimo. Io non ho utilizzato la parola nazionalismo, ma quando mi riferivo all'importanza della politica estera, a riscoprire l'orgoglio britannico, ma anche alla eh, battaglia sul mito negativo del tacismo, chi ha distrutto la Gran Bretagna, mi riferivo al recupero di uno spirito nazionalistico che gioca un ruolo chiave. Sarebbe stato forse opportuno effettivamente utilizzare il termine nazionalismo. Eh, poi per quanto riguarda le considerazioni di Sebastiano Bavetta, sì, è un problema importantissimo, è un rischio fortissimo per il liberalismo. Beh, io ho utilizzato, come ho specificato, forse non abbastanza, il termine giacobinismo in maniera provocatoria. Sarebbe stato più opportuno utilizzare il termine populismo, infatti poi nel saggio che ho scritto utilizza il termine populismo e non giacobinismo se non tra parentesi. Eh, però indubbiamente i rischi di una politica lideristica, chiamiamola soltanto così, a favore, una pianificazione a favore del mercato, è un liderismo che riporta ai valori del mercato della libertà, è un percorso pericolosissimo. La taccia è interessante perché si va a innestare in un processo più ampio che era la battaglia delle idee e in una nazione che comunque aveva un'eredità culturale per quanto fossero passati degli anni che l'avevano scalfita che era fondata in quella direzione, è una democrazia molto solida. Eh, che però sia un rischio utilizzare questo strumento sono perfettamente d'accordo, va preso con le pinze. Rimane il fatto che oggi il liberalismo deve confrontarsi con il fatto di non avere una teoria su come tornare indietro, se il problema è tornare indietro e non soltanto limitare una crescita ulteriore dello Stato. Su questo non ci sono teorie, non ci sono grandi strumenti se non anche fare appello a un utilizzo forse della politica stessa. Quindi questo è uno strumento che comunque va indagato. Credo che forse più che la categoria giacobinismo, populismo o altro, un elemento interessante su cui riflettere è l'essere outsider rispetto al sistema politico. E la Thatcher lo era, come ho detto prima, perché era una donna, perché era la figlia di, di, di un droghiere, poi insomma, i suoi denigratori che la chiamavano figlia del droghiere si dimenticavano che era anche moglie di un miliardario, ma questi sono dettagli. Eh, comunque non era una persona che si era adagiata a um, un, un, uno stile di vita e anche uno stile comunicativo che era o da establishment o da aristocrazia. Lei era un, un elemento di rottura, era un outsider e aveva una determinazione assoluta nel fare le cose. Cioè le diceva semplicemente questo è il mio progetto e io lo realizzerò. Se non, vole, se non me lo vole, volete far realizzare dovete mandarmi via perché sull'obiettivo finale io non arrivo a compromessi che è quello che è mancato in Italia, molto semplicemente. I politici italiani che si sono susseguiti negli anni e hanno promesso riforme hanno detto facciamo la grande riforma, poi bisogna contrattare con Tizio e con Caio, con questa lobby e con quell'altra, l'anna qui, qui l'anna qui lì e poi di riforme non se ne sono fatte. La Thatcher per carattere, forse anche per il modo in cui era arrivata a conquistare la leadership del partito, aveva impostato la sua leadership come una leadership divisiva all'interno del partito, che andava a dividere, no? One of us, eh, eccetera, eccetera, tutte queste cose che utilizzava. E questo era un cambiamento radicale nella politica del consensus britannico e sarebbe una, un cambiamento radicale anche nella politica italiana. Adesso i prossimi mesi ci diranno se eh, la politica italiana sta andando verso una direzione di questo tipo. Allora adesso concludiamo diciamo, in bellezza questa sessione, diamo la parola al professor Giono Sullivan che è stato, ha avuto diciamo, la fortuna di essere un collaboratore nonché ghostwriter di Margaret Thatcher. Welcome. Okay.
um, I think we're running a little late, uh, if I'm right. In which case, I presume you don't want me to talk for an hour and a half. Um, so uh, I'll try to compress what I'm to say, but I would be grateful, and you'll be grateful, if after I've spoken for about 25 minutes, someone tells me, and I can then try to bring my remarks to a reasonably speedy close. Um, well, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies for a very warm welcome, for a, a generous hospitality, and for the opportunity to visit this marvelous city. My only regret is that the city, which is in the wine country, your invitation has come during Lent. Uh, so I, <laughs> but I still, Sundays don't count as part of Lent, <laughs> and uh, so all is not lost. Uh, my credentials for delivering this speech are somewhat different from the academic distinctions of the previous speakers. I covered Mrs. Thatcher as a journalist um, uh, from 1972 to 1986 from fairly close range. Um, I worked on the editorial staff of the Daily Telegraph, which was very sympathetic to her, um, and even became a kind of link between her office and the editor. Uh, later, I worked with her in Downing Street as a special advisor, and informally as a speechwriter for three years. And after she left office, I continued an occasional speechwriter as one of the small team insisted um, that assisted her in writing her memoirs, and we became friends. As a result, I hoped for her success when she was fighting her political battles, and I was proud of her achievements when she lost office. As Professor Bale and I were discussing over coffee, it's really quite flattering to Mrs. Thatcher's memory that 150 people should be demonstrating against her outside. If they were admitted to hear Professor Bale, of course, they would at least be better informed of the case against her. Um, now, I suppose I am an unreconstructed Thatcherite. Uh, it gives me the advantages of closeness and inside knowledge. I was sometimes in the room when important decisions were taken, yet I'm obviously less detached and dispassionate than other speakers when I look at her struggles and achievements. But all our judgments and our arguments, whatever their provenance, have to meet the same tests of accuracy and truth. And with the passage of time and the opening of archives, those tests will become more exacting and more capable of giving us all surprises, including to those of us who were in the room at the time. Now, um, I think, uh, in order to cut things uh, short, I'm going to skip a, a long section in which we discuss her, uh, so to speak, position today. And then I'm going to look, say very briefly, um, what I think uh, Thatcherism is about and, uh, and what her record and legacy is. But I'm going to keep that very short and then I'm going to turn to attacks against it. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, understand the basic drive of Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism, it's to be found in some words she addressed to a television interviewer, Michael Cockrell, towards the close of the 1979 election campaign. With the campaign almost over, she let down her guard and explain, exclaimed, I can't bear Britain in decline. I s just can't bear it. That was what was driving her. But she was a practical politician, uh, and she had to approach it, uh, the problem she faced, in a very gingerly way. Yes, her remedies for Britain's economic failure, while they were cautious and flexible in dealing with problems as they arose, were drawn very largely from the tradition of liberal economics. But as several people have by now pointed out, that tradition was one that had been common to both parties until shortly before the First World War, and indeed was dominant until 1929. So she starts out being friendly to classical liberal economics. But when British interests uh, were challenged, in other words, she wanted to revive the country. She saw it initially in economic terms. Um, but when British interests were challenged from quite another quarter in the Falklands War, um, um, she had to take up the challenge. And in doing so, she drew on two other British political traditions, the tough-minded, realistic Tory tradition of national interest and the more moralistic one of liberal internationalism, both of which she used to justify her patriotic purposes. It's, a mis it's misleading to think of her solely as a nationalist. She was a nationalist, but she was also an internationalist because she took the view that internationalism was a set of arrangements between uh, nation states, 
and, and international organizations should act as the agents of nation states rather than the other way around. And then thirdly, if a fierce patriotism drove her, it was governed by a highly practical prudence. I think her two central victories in the Falklands War and the miners' strike illustrate that. She didn't expect or plan for the Argentinian seizure of the island, but of course, a politics of national regeneration cannot refuse such a challenge. But she was very cautious. Though she was annoyed by Haig's mediation efforts, she let them play out to the end. She took calculated risks, militarily and diplomatically, but only after she had digested the best expert advice. She maneuvered her way to victory quite as much as boldly moving towards it. Similarly, she surrendered to the miners' union demands in 1981, when she knew that the nation had insufficient coal stocks to resist a strike. But she at once began preparations, including a buildup of coal stocks at power stations, to resist a strike later. And when it came, she won. Still, despite her caution in dealing with these two crises, nonetheless, the way she handled her victories ran counter to the usual post-war politics of compromise and splitting the difference. Together with her prominence in Cold War diplomacy uh, and her successful economic policy, I realize not everyone agrees with that, they established her domestic dominance, they entrenched her economic and labor union reforms as a new consensus in British politics, and they elevated her international profile. Um, i just say in an aside here, I've lived abroad out of England really for most of the last 30 years. And I have to say that the attitude of the British or the English to their own country is really quite interesting because they are much more depressive, defeatist and masochistic about it than, than, than foreigners are. When foreigners don't have any illusions about the British. They know it's a middle ranking power, but it's a disproportionately influential middle ranking power culturally, uh, diplomatically, and to some extent militarily, given the, the fact that um, it's one of two European states that actually can mount military operations, though most of them need, needing the assistance of the Americans. But it, nonetheless, it's not the way, the, the way British people often look at themselves as dust beneath the chariot wheels of the United States is not the way people in Washington think of these things. Now, her domestic success was very limited. It didn't include the welfare state, she left reform too late there. It didn't include the European Union, where she was brought down in part uh, because she was beginning to question the European commitment ahead of her party. Still, in the end, she created a new consensus. Not quite what she wanted, but better than what she had fought in 79, and better than would have happened if the Tories had just continued drifting. In now, when we come to foreign affairs, I think her record is slightly different again from the way it's been described. She was important in getting West European governments to resist the powerful peace movement and therefore getting US missiles stationed in Western Europe. She was important in that. And I can give examples. Um, and that was the key moment when the Soviets lost the Cold War. Secondly, she did bring to Reagan and Michael Gorbachev together in their crab-wise dance to ending the Cold War. That was useful, it wasn't that important. And she was, of course, very much the subordinate partner in the relationship with Reagan on military and diplomatic policy. And given the relative size of the British and American economies, that should have been true in economic policy as well. But it wasn't. As Owen Harry, as the distinguished Australian editor of the National Interest magazine, points out, he, his view was that she would be re regarded as more important and influential than Reagan when it came to, in, 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 to economic international reform. Why was that? Well, the recovery of the British economy in the 1980s was more impressive because it started from a lower economic point and occurred in a more influential and left-wing country. Then Thatcher had harder opposition to overcome. Her labor market deregulation, for instance, had to overcome opposition from within her own party as well as from Labour MPs. Next, the reforms had to defeat a non-parliamentary challenge from the Labour unions. But once the miners were defeated, um, the British economy joined the American one in providing demonstration effects of what free market reforms could achieve in a relatively short time. Now, those reforms were not identical. Uh, those demonstration effects were not identical. 
Tax cuts were America's principal intellectual export economically in the 80s. Privatization was Britain's. And of the two, privatization has turned out to be more important globally, since both third world and post-communist economies were burdened by large and inefficient state industries. And when privatization succeeded with surprising speed, the most unlikely converts took note. While I was researching my book on Reagan, Thatcher, and the Pope, I found this interesting and unwitting tribute to the Iron Lady in the Soviet Politburo archives. Um, I brought it up here because it's a conversation between Gorbachev and the then General Secretary of the Italian Communist Party, Alexander Natter. And Natter, the uh, leader of the party, begins, you know, we communists have either overestimated or underestimated the functions of the welfare state. We keep defending situations in which it is now clear we shouldn't defend. As a result, a bureaucratic apparatus which serves itself has swelled. It's interesting that a certain similarity with your situation which you call stagnation, can be seen at home. Gorbachev replies, yes, I'm afraid that Parkinson's law works everywhere. Natter then says, any bureauc bureaucratization encourages the apparatus to protect its own interests and to forget about the citizens' interests. I suppose that is why the rights demands for pre privatization are falling on fertile ground in Western public opinion. And that's another reason why Thatcher, more than Reagan, posed an economic challenge to the Soviet Union. Uh, that challenge was either reform or fall ever further behind the capitalist West. The comparison between the British recovery after a decade of free market economics and the continuing stagnation of the Soviet economy after 70 years of communism was simply too embarrassing for Gorbachev to ignore. When Perestroika was introduced, however, and he, as a result, it destroyed the communist system it was designed to save. And after that, once the common command economies of the Soviet bloc collapsed, revealing the extraordinary wasteland of state planning, it was the Thatcher model that the new democracies sought, post-communist democracies mainly sought to emulate. Yes, she, Reagan certainly, John Paul II, were all heroes in post-communist Europe. But it was Thatcher to whom the new economic, economy ministers like uh, Lechek Balcerowicz in Poland, Baklav Klaus in Czechoslovakia, Martlar in Estonia, looked to, as their model on how to reform a bankrupt socialist economy. And they say exactly that. The more that, um, and so on. Uh, it wasn't only moreover, and this is my final point about her achievements, and which, is only, which is an influence here rather than a direct achievement, it wasn't only in the post-communist world that Thatcher was seen as an inspiration. Thatcherism had an important impact both in Africa and Asia. Privatization, the better control of public debt, lower taxes, the reductions of barriers to trade and capital movements, these became the new conventional wisdom in ministries of finance around the globe. Mrs. Thatcher herself emerged in retirement as a kind of economic heroine of Asian capitalism, invited regularly to Asian countries and consulted by their governments. And the economic transformation in Asia brought literally, literally billions of Asian workers out of subsistence economies and into the global labor market. They have created new middle classes across Asia, and not irrelevantly, they reduced the cost of living for people in Europe and North America, even as they lifted the standard of living for poor people in what used to be called the third world. Now, I am not saying that these are the, so, the results solely of Mrs. Thatcher's influence. Of course they're not. Deng Xiaoping, Lee Kuan Yew, and the Taiwanese played an important part too, but uh, a more important part. But, um, but as, Mrs. Thatcher would herself point out, and in this context, she might even be seconded by Professor Gamble, these results are a success for the traditional British or Whig economic policy, or what he calls Anglo-America. Sound money, secure property rights, free trade, free movement of capital. And they occurred at least in part because Mrs. Thatcher had argued for them, implemented them, revived the British economy with them, and made them a new conventional wisdom. Did these policies lead to the 2008 financial crisis, which occurred 18 years later? Well, that's an interesting question. Let's discuss it tomorrow. So that's the end of the pro-Thatcherite lesson. No doubt you think it exaggerated, and maybe it is. All the same, I think I can make a good case for almost all of the separate points just made. Mrs. Thatcher, as I say, was not, of course, the sole influence on the developments I described, but she was a contributory factor 
and sometimes an influential and decisive one. Now let me turn to the anti-Thatcher case. There are three schools here, at least three schools today. The first such school is that of partisan labor and liberal critics who argued that her economic policies straightforwardly failed. I had written down here that they are often politicians and journalists who were opposed to her at the time of her emergence as a Tory leader and who cling to the original basis of their antipathy. But having heard Professor Bale earlier today, I can see that I must bring that criticism up to date. My own view is, though, is, is that although serious errors of economic policy were made, they were outweighed by its successes, in particular by the rise of productivity and the structural change which continued to deliver British success for a long time. Some of the successes were evident at the time. She left Britain as the world's fourth largest economy, after all. But the general and sustained improvement in Britain's economic performance continued through the major and Blair administrations right up to, to, to the financial crisis. Gordon Brown, indeed, on becoming chancellor in 1997, was giving a treasury briefing of the economy, which concluded with the words, these are wonderful figures, to which he famously replied, what do you want me to do, send them a thank you note? But the purely economic legacy of Thatcherism is something we will be debating, I think, tomorrow. So I will simply add here that even if the these criticisms of Thatcher's economic legacy were correct. That would not be a conclusive criticism of her, of her overall record. Her privatization revolution, her safeguarding of constitutional democracy in her defeat of the miners, her victory in the Falklands War, her role alongside Reagan and Cole in the defeat of communism, her trade union reforms, these and other changes are plainly major, and I would say plainly beneficial in political or strategic or constitutional terms, even if they contributed little or nothing to economic improvement. Now, one can certainly mount criticisms of them, I agree with that, but I don't think you can persuade most people that they are substantial failures or disasters. And the evidence for that is that even where Labour and Liberal Democrat parties continue to dislike them, they do not propose their repeal or rejection. As a result, many Thatcher policies have become the new status quo. Now, the second school of critics um, <coughs> excuse me, is the liberal intelligentsia in Britain. Her critics in the cultural establishment, the BBC, the universities, and so on. They have largely retreated from the earlier criticisms of her dress sense, accent, and all-round philistinism, uh, which were alarmingly snobbish, suburban, low, odiously vulgar, and they embarrassed them rather than her. They now suggest in a world-weary way that she wasn't that important. A conventional Tory politician until 1975 when she saw a gap in the market and adopted an economic liberalism then in vogue. She was more a symptom of global changes than their inspirer. She didn't make much of a difference. The distinguished historian David Callendine had a polished version of this thesis in the New York Times on the week of her death. I quote, before 1974, her convictions were the conventional welfare state pieties of post-war consensus Toryism. She authorized the sale of public council houses to their tenants and the privatization of nationalized industries, and she broke the militant trade unions. But these things were occurring throughout the Western world. Mrs. Thatcher merely intensified a trend already in train. She was at least, a much, at least as much a product of her times as she was a master of them, and so on. Well, I suppose it might be more comforting to be defeated by a major historical trend than by an actual living person. But none of these critics argued in the 1980s, at least I don't recall them, that Mrs. Thatcher was the, benefit of favor was the beneficiary of favorable historical trends. Indeed, they usually argued the very opposite, namely that she was foolishly defying inevitable trends. And what were the governments pursuing these policies um, uh, and pioneering these trends in 1974 when Mrs. Thatcher began to emerge as their apostle. They were New Zealand's Labour government and Pinochet in Chile. Neither, for different reasons, likely to lead the world into new sunlit uplands of economic philosophy. No government, then or later, attracted anything like the attention that was devoted to Britain's Thatcher experiment. Arguably, the Chinese came close. These dismissive claims by her liberal critics are also false biographically. As Charles Moore 
Charles Moore's new biography makes clear, she gradually developed a political position that was subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, different from the Tory establishment's policies in both government and opposition. Not in his book, but a good example is that in the early 1960s, she told a meeting of despairing Tory MPs brought together by the Institute of Economic Affairs that they should go into a different business if they couldn't persuade the voters that Marks and Spencers gave them a better deal than the post office. In 1968, when she was the leading front bench, a leading front bencher in the Tory opposition, she gave a, a major lecture mentioned by Professor Gamble um, to the annual party conference in which almost all the ideas that later became um, known as Thatcherism were clearly laid out. It wasn't a manifesto, I agree, but they're all there. Um, I attended the lecture and I well remember the reaction of younger conservatives afterwards as we went down to um, have a drink. Someone high in the party was saying some of the things they believed in and speaking their language. Now, there were other people who was doing that, but nobody was doing so in quite the way she did that night. I could give other examples, but Mrs. Thatcher was a prudent and practical politician who knew that second-rank ministers cannot afford the luxury of opinions that deviate too far from cabinet policy. So she bided her time. Still, anyone who paid attention knew of her opinions, her character, and her forcefulness. So when she was a candidate to enter the shadow cabinet, Ted Heath said, yes, she's the ablest woman we have, but Willie says that if we let her in, we'll never be able to get rid of her. A nice non-entity was appointed in her stead. And the fierce battles that she had to fight both inside her own cabinet and against a really quite energized labor movement, that I agree with, at least places a question mark against the notion that she simply served uh, historical trends to success. And that brings me to the third school of contemporary critics. This is a large and heterogeneous one, composed of all those who have to explain why Mrs. Thatcher's achievements, which now look more or less undeniable, are less praiseworthy than the unsophisticated might imagine. It includes Tory wets and Tory modernizers, um, opposition politicians too young to recall the arguments of the 1980s, and the makers of the movie The Iron Lady. The common theme that links such disparate critics is that Mrs. Thatcher was a courageous woman who won important battles but deserves little credit for this because a more amenable leader would, could have won them with less acrimony and conflict. Let me start with the movie The Iron Lady, starring Meryl Streep. The great weakness of this otherwise well-done film is its sketchy treatment of politics. At first showing, this treatment is a kaleidoscopic jumble. The struggle against inflation, the winter of discontent, the miners' strike, the end of the Cold War, each conveyed in a few phrases some footage of rioting and fighting, a handful of bold declaratory sentences from our heroine, and then on to the next one. The Cold War, for instance, is compressed into Thatcher dancing with Reagan, the Berlin Wall coming down, and the Paris conference that ended the Cold War formally. Her opposition to the euro is alluded to, is alluded to in a single sentence, which I suspect was added as a result of the euro crisis. To some extent, this kind of compression is a cinematic necessity, but the result is that we get very little political context that would explain the reasons for these various conflicts. Nothing about the revived Soviet threat in the mid uh, to late 1970s, nothing about the miners' leader, Arthur Scargill, mounting an explicitly political challenge to the government, nothing about the erosion of national sovereignty within the European Union, nothing about the battles over the ERM and shadowing the Deutschmark, this is a film about politics without politics. The absence of context has consequences. Since we get little or no explanation of each of these various conflicts, with the exception of the Falklands War, they end up united by a single common theme, namely the nature of Mrs. Thatcher and her divisive leadership. Accordingly, the one political aspect of the Thatcher years that gets repeated attention is her struggles with her cabinet colleagues. That becomes, by default, the movie's subtext. Margaret Thatcher is a battler who has battled all her life. Others might listen, learn, sympathize, compromise, but she bulldozes her way through and over these lesser mortals. She duly battles her way um, 
uh, sorry, she duly battles her way through all the conflicts, accompanied by her hostile but cowed cabinet, um, first as sullen plotters, then as reluctant warriors, counseling in action, then as toadying sycophants, overwhelmed by her success, then finally as sullen plotters who realize that over the poll tax in Europe, she has finally gone too far and could be safely brought down. The film's thesis, to borrow a line from 1066 and all that, is that, is that Thatcher was wrong but romantic. Her bravery and determination were admirable, but her policies divided people, their costs were too high, and the same results could have been achieved in a more consensual way. And that is actually the fallback position of Thatcher's opponents in the Tory party, the wets at the time and the modernizers today. They now concede that she got the big things right, but they still nurse a wounded vanity, because in winning those battles, she demonstrated that their entire political strategy was rooted in a defeatism that proved mistaken. Managing an inevitable decline inevitably looks very foolish when the decline is actually reversed. They need a, a new excuse. So the fallback position admits Thatcher's virtues as follows. Her career was magnificent in its bravura way, but was it really necessary? Did Britain pay too high a price? Did her family pay too high a price? Did she herself pay too high a price? Well, no, no, no is an appropriately Thatcherite answer to that question, those questions. But the movie wants you to answer yes, yes, yes. There's a reason why we should refuse to say yes. Meryl Streep's portrayal of battling Maggie is not only an uncannily brilliant impersonation, I saw the movie just a month, but two weeks after I'd spent some time with Mrs. Thatcher. It also triumphs over the underlying t subtext of a quarrelsome and divisive leader. The sight of Miss Streep as Mrs. Thatcher in her prime, dragging along a lot of timid males in, the, in her wake, and I was one of them, as if they were slaves in a Roman triumph, is a truth that sweeps away all the omissions, subtext, and skeptical questions scattered along the text. Despite itself, against its will, the movie celebrates its central character. And that is surely truer to history um, than the um, scriptwriter's intention. What happened in Britain in the 80s was a genuine social crisis in which a reforming government set out to deprive powerful vested interests of their rents and privileges in order to revive the economy, restrain inflation, and restore social stability. That kind of thing requires tough measures, both economically and indeed in police terms. Now, Professor Vinan points out in his book, um, uh, rightly, that the government derived little credit from its victory over the miners because the public disliked the measures that had purchased this victory. Given the character of its opponents, however, and the tactics that they pursued, would other methods have worked better or even as well? It is self-deception to imagine that either an emollient Tory leader or a conference of social democratic stateholders would have defeated the miners or inflation or Argentinian fascist generals. It was sentimentality on the part of the British public to resent the government because it felt a nostalgic admiration for the miners whose defeat it had supported and called for. And those emotions are not the stuff of serious politics. They are, they are feeble forms of nostalgia. So, I don't know, don't think I will necessarily have persuaded you, but the three main criticisms today of the Thatcher legacy that I've singled out, she failed, she didn't really matter, she could have won with much less storm and drang, they just simply don't hold water. So what, therefore, is the legacy and why is it valuable today? Now, all of the things I've just said make Thatcherism sound like a very powerful medicine, rather like Macaulay's view of the French Revolution as something that almost kills you, but that once you have recovered, proved to have rid your system of some long-standing chronic ailments that had seriously weakened you. If that's so, then there is some value in finding out what are its ingredients, um, if they work at all on patients and whether they can be ex manufactured and exported. Um, as so often in the social sciences, it's easier to answer these questions in the negative, to diagnose what Thatcherism is not rather than what it is. Early diagnosis of Thatcherism, therefore, tend to be mistaken even when they are helpful and point in the right direction. Among such diagnoses, I would list the first definition of Thatcherism in Marxism today, and I think 
uh, by Professor Campbell as a free economy and a strong state. This uh, definition was right in sensing early that Thatcherism was something different from the Conservative Party's mix as usual. It persuaded many conservatives to read Marxism today, and as Professor Bannon has pointed out, almost as many conservatives to write for it as well. But I think it was inadequate and partial as a diagnosis. It overemphasized the purely economic element in Thatcherism. It encouraged the notion that Thatcherism was an ideological project conceived um, and advanced and imposed, uh, conceived in advance and imposed on Britain from almost theoretical calculations. As Mrs. Letwin points out in her, I think, I personally think magisterial analysis of Thatcherism, the problem with large overarching theories is they don't actually give you any help in solving the problems in front of you. Even Lenin had to ditch Marxism in order to solve the problem facing him in 1917 and later, although he characteristically presented his adaptations as a development of the Marxist theory. And perhaps I may be permitted a brief digression here. The belief on the left, especially among Blairites, that Thatcherism was an ideological project, successful one, led them to attempt their own project, which of course produced a series of setbacks. For instance, his first administration's policies on health and education, and then had to be adapted, amended, and reversed out of all recognition. Nevertheless, the Cameronian Tories, impressed by Blair, duly sought to copy his project, which was a misunderstanding of Thatcherism, as a project of their own. That has produced UKIP. Um, there is a postmodern novel in this kind of thing, but I don't see an election manifesto there. My digression is just finished. So the first truth about Thatcher, and therefore Thatcherism, is that it was not a matter of theory, but a practical response to the problems of Britain in the 1970s and 80s. Others have said this, and I think they are right. Mrs. Thatcher did not look behind herself to theory, but in front of herself to the problems. Since these included inflation, a large public sector deficit, hard to control government spending, over mighty trade unions, wasteful state industries, over manning, restrictive practices, and a rise in world energy prices due to OPEC, her practical responses were principally going to be seen in economic policy. But the emphasis, excuse me, but the emphasis within the economic policy changed over time. Monetarism was replaced by privatization, which was replaced by health and welfare reform, which was replaced by the search for a monet monetarist substitute as inflation again became a problem. And economic policy itself, though always important, uh, was sometimes subordinated to other considerations, namely to defense in the Cold War and to victory in the Falklands War. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, for, ex for example, uh, was not in the war cabinet. The career of monetarism is especially revealing. This began as a diagnosis of inflation, where it was roughly right, but then became an instrument for reducing it, where it fell victim to Goodhart's law that policy instruments lose their reliability when they become, sorry, lose their policy, <laughs> policy instruments lose their reliability as indicators. A personal anecdote may be interesting here. I had dinner in Washington with Alan Walters on the night in 1980, I think, or 81, before he returned to Downing Street to advise the Prime Minister. Now, there had been at that point much discussion about the apparent combination, perverse combination, of an econ economy suffering from visible contraction, job losses, bankruptcies on a large scale, with figures showing a rise in the money supply. That night, Alan said what he later told the Prime Minister. The real economy was the best indicator of monetary policy and its effects. The figures, uh, monetary figures were misleading, and the monetary policy had to be gr greatly eased. Well, that duly happened, and after a time lag, the economy began recovering. But not before a monetary squeeze of unintended harshness had squeezed out a great deal of overmanning, changed the balance of power within industry in favor of management, imposed Hayekian shock tactics on the economy when ministers thought they were actually pursuing a Friedmanite gradualist policy and acted, to eff and acted in effect as a catalyst for a microeconomic supply side revolution in industry. Uh, um, Professor Gamble quoted David Willits as saying something similar, and, and it, is, it is, I think, one of the most interesting moments in Thatcherism. Um, excuse me. Um, 
uh, stage one of monetarism was therefore abandoned to be replaced by targeting the exchange rate, which in due course became shadowing the Deutsche Mark, which later led to inflation and finally the reigning back of the policy. Mrs. Thatcher claimed she had never known that her chancellor, Nigel Lawson, was shadowing the Deutsche Mark, disputed his argument that it would restrain inflation, argued that, on the contrary, it would fuel inflation in those circumstances, and after an interval, succeeded in halting the policy. As a matter of full disclosure, I should say that Lord Lawson himself disputes this account in a letter to Standpoint, replying to an article of mine I've just responded, and I think that would probably end the dispute, but it may not. Whatever the reason, though, inflation did rise substantially in the later 80s, damaging the government's reputation, worsening its difficulties on other fronts, and weakening Mrs. Thatcher to the point that she had to yield to cabinet pressure to join the European realignment mechanism, and, of course, eventually to lose power. One can argue that the economic course of Thatcherism was bookended by two um, major mistakes. A monetary contraction that helped it to improve productivity dramatically in the early 80s and a policy of shadowing the Deutsche Mark of which Mrs. Thatcher was unaware that revived inflation and damaged Thatcherism's most single achievement to that point. Now, these two events are important in the history of Marxism. But what do they tell us about the... Uh, uh, sorry, of Thatcherism. But what do they tell us about the nature of Thatcherism? Um, and what they tell us is that monetarism was merely one of several policy interests that the Thatcherites employed to reduce inflation. As each of these instruments proved wanting or to have undesirable side effects, it was abandoned and something else was tried. So what was the underlying consistency which these instruments were designed to serve? Well, I could say the conquest of inflation or the restoration of budgetary balance or the need for higher productivity. All these were valuable and were pursued. But as one of the platform speakers has said, has written, um, all governments seek those objectives. Um, what was distinctive about Thatcherism, as both Professor Vinan and Mrs. Letwin seem to agree, is that these things were pursued indirectly. Thatcherites hoped to bring them about not through direct policies of intervention to get government or to get people or companies to do certain things, but by establishing a framework of stability that would give them the certainty and the confidence to pursue their own aims and interests. Once such a framework was in place, people were to be trusted to act in such a way as to lead to these other desired results. Monetarism was initially one such framework in economic policy. Nigel Lawson's 98 tax reform, 1988 tax reforms were intended to be another. Um, but direct intervention was not wholly ruled out. If a particular framework was failing, then the government would have to reshape it or to find an alternative. Hence the frequent and largely unashamed changes of policy in the 80s when some instrument did fail. The important thing was to find a substitute for it quickly. The 1981 budget, in a way, was that. So that everyone could see that the main objectives had not been abandoned. Mrs. Thatcher's personal reputation as a till of the hen was a useful support for the Thatcherite strategy. She was seen as a formidable guarantor, a lady not for you turning, of the overall strategy of, of creating the stable conditions in which people and companies would exert themselves to do better things. And that brings in the second basic element in Thatcherism, um, Mrs. Letwin's vigorous virtues. These are hard work. Diligence, saving for a rainy day, prudence, sobriety, self-control, enterprise, and probably a religion like Methodism with a moral earnestness that many people in major cities like to mock. These are the virtues that enable people to be self-reliant, to live in a free society, to found businesses, to get promotions, to bring up families well, and to take up opportunities, and in general, to play an independent life a part in social life as broadly defined. Now, some have sneered, as you can, at these things as selfish, acquisitive, greedy. But though some energetic people certainly have such vices, the vigorous virtues are in fact quite as likely to be used for self-chosen charitable goals as much for self-interested ones. Indeed, they are the essential foundation of the softer virtues, such as compassion, since only self-reliant people are in a position to help others. Mrs. Thatcher's strength here was that she did not merely approve of these virtues in a theoretical way. She lived them, she incarnated them. She was a well-brought-up Methodist girl 
again, Professor Gamble's point, whose favorite religious quotation was John Wesley's, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Her, lever, her revolution was a provincial one before it, well, conquered the world, maybe that's excessive, a moral revolution before it was an economic one. She knew the vigorous virtues had existed in her time, and like many people, she thought that they had been discouraged and sapped. She wanted to revive them, to add opportunities, and to trust people to do the right thing. And in fact, what is really remarkable here is that the vigorous virtues became vigorous again rather quickly, though not universally. Thatcherite policies began to be seriously implemented about 1980-81, and by the middle 80s, inflation was coming down and productivity was rising. By the 1987 election, there was a general sense in Britain and abroad that the country had recovered and was beginning to thrive. Now, that's not a statistic, but I think it's something worth paying attention to. In Mrs. Letwin's book, this revival is rooted in a sophisticated epistemology and a view of Britain that it has and has, it had and has a unique spirit of ordered liberty that visitors in the past had noticed and admired. Now, one need not share her entire thesis in order to see Thatcherism as essentially the recovery of that spirit. And that spirit is essentially the spirit of an English liberalism that, as Professor Gamble mentioned, citing Letwin, a liberalism that crossed both parties. It did so in the 19th century, and it was still strong in both parties when I began to be interested in politics. As a practical politician, Mrs. Thatcher, too, was a work in progress. She was constantly feeling her way in new policy areas, learning as she went. But she was doing so in line with those remembered instincts and with the, uh, with the f and, 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 and since, when you're making decisions, you have to be guided by something. She wasn't guided by theory in an artificial sense. She simply thought in a certain way as a result of being brought up in that kind of society. Now, um, I think I now have to finish, and I'll say simply one for more thing, because there are other, many other points we could discuss, and I hope will tomorrow. Is Thatcherism for export? Or is it strictly an, an expression of English political culture, as Mrs. Letwin holds? Well, I put that question in preparation for this uh, uh, meeting to a very distinguished Hungarian economist, a former governor of the bank. And I asked him, had Thatcherism made any kind of impact? And his reply was that, yes, um, it had led about three or four years after the end of communism. Uh, it, well, it, first of all, it had given people the impression, hey, you don't have to just hang around waiting for other people to do something for you. You can get up and you can do it for yourself. And that was an attitude which had been more or less bred and bullied out of Hungarian people under communism. But she had represented that attitude and that message had come through from, from, um, from her star. Um, he thought that this had led to 10 years in which entrepreneurship had spread. He thought that it had stalled for the moment for reasons which are probably too dull and complicated to get into here. But he believed that the, the entrepreneurs and the people who work for them were much better off, even though they weren't as well off as they thought they should be, as a result of what had happened. And that was the result, and that was, um, and that was the impact, he thought, of um, a British politician whose messages through most of the period we're talking about had arrived in Hungary filtered through a hostile government-controlled press. Well, these are matters for later sessions. I will simply say that I believe that the legacy of Thatcherism is a genuine liberal one, uh, a genuine, oh, maybe one final point. Um, she was, of course, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, there were c strictly conservative aspects to her character, demonstrated in the Falklands War and in foreign policy more generally. She was a Tory patriot but one who had a respect for international agreements and international rules. That is one of the reasons why she became more critical of the European Union, as she felt she discovered it was moving towards an interventionist federalism, which she found unfavorable, objectionable on both counts. That, for most commentators, that is now regarded as a major error on her part, and it certainly helped to cost her the prime ministership. But her instincts are now the basis for powerful movements in two British political parties. But these are ma ma matters for a later session. Let me conclude by stating that the legacy of Thatcherism is a liberal one, 
and it's, it, is a, it is a matter of power being handed back to the people, being relatively confident that they, uh, most of them, will do something useful with it. Thank you very much. I, I, I don't know whether you want me to carry on, it's quite late. I'm happy to do so because I, I may have critics in the audience. <laughs> Allora, possiamo provare a vedere se funziona di nuovo il, il gelato. Leonardo, mh, puoi portare il microfono da far girare, vediamo se funziona e lo facciamo girare tra la platea. Se poi non funziona vi chiederei di venire qui al, al banco. I think dinner calls. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you. You mentioned uh, influence within the um, Soviet boundaries, I mean, in Eastern Europe mm. uh, more specifically. And now you're, you're living and you're um, chairing a think tank in Hungary. Three examples you brought are Vaclav Klaus, uh, Leshin Balcerovic, and Mark Lahr. Mm. But, I mean, none of this was really a, a political leader. I mean, uh, Mark Lahr was prime minister, but then lost election, I mean, uh, and, and came back later on. He's an historian by background, and Stone is very particular. I mean, it's a, it will be basically the equivalent of, of, of the mayor of not Luca, but Florence, I mean, an important position in Italy nowadays, but for different reasons. Um, I wouldn't go to Estonia if I were you, but come <laughs> Leszek Balcerowicz was uh, yeah. deputy prime minister very briefly and then leader party, but he never succeeded in getting out as a, um, as a political leader for, 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 for voters, I mean, not just for economists. And, and Václav, of course, uh, well, he became head of state, uh, but he was always very um, controversial and, and not particularly popular uh, figure. I suspect that something similar applies to uh, Thatcherites in different governments all over the world. I mean, you referred to a Thatcherite consensus within finance ministries. So uh, doesn't all of these conspire in favor of the thesis which actually it is very difficult to export Thatcherism, even when you know that the failure of socialism was so uh, clearly making up for a nice uh, field for it. I think it is very difficult to, sorry, in, to export Thatcherism, um, no, but not for the reason uh, you've just given. I think it's difficult because uh, it reflects the liberalism of the English-speaking world, and there are liberalisms in Italy, of course, very strong liberal tradition, and there are liberal traditions throughout Europe, but they tend to have a slightly different uh, character, and they are anyway in a different political context with... Um, um, uh, uh, coalition governments, uh, proportional representation, great difficulty to get any kind of agreement, particularly uh, liberal agreements through. So, so I, I think there are problems, practical ones. But as regards the three people you mentioned, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't agree with you. Um, Mark Lahr um, was prime minister and he did manage to change the economic policy dramatically even though he didn't last very long. Um, and there hasn't been, as with Mrs. Thatcher, a real reversal. I mean, there been uh, reversal politically, but not in policy. Secondly, the, um, uh, the um, sorry, the second, oh yes, Balcerowicz was the father of uh, the, the Polish miracle. He was governor, he was finance minister, and he was governor, he's now governor of the bank, I think, or was. Um, and his policy ch uh, was accepted by people who probably didn't altogether agree with it, but, uh, but it, was pushed through, and Poland has had the best economic record in post-communist Europe. Um, it didn't suffer a recession during, since, um, since 2008. Now, the most interesting one is Klaus. Uh, Klaus is generally seen as playing second fiddle to uh, Vaclav Havel, and as a kind of popular figure, that's certainly true. Um, and, and, um, but 
but his influence on the development of the Czech Republic has actually been greater than Havel's was. First of all, um, he was the person who, who brought about the change in economic policy, which has by and large had good results, not completely so. And secondly, he was the man who, he didn't push through exactly, but he helped to midwife the velvet divorce between um, the Czechs and the Slovaks, which contrary to practically every establishment figure in the world, John Major went there to plead to the, to the, not, not to do it, um, has been a great success for both countries. Um, and the reason it's been a success for the Slovaks is when the Czechs couldn't be relied upon to keep sending them Czechs, they suddenly had to um, bring about the economic reforms that previously they'd shrunk from. So I don't altogether agree with your account, but, uh, but that, there is, um, uh, that it is hard to bring about um, uh, Thatcherite type uh, changes uh, anywhere is I think true and and I think uh, you know the reason is it's quite hard for an accountant uh, to persuade uh, the, the head of spending departments that they've really got to cut back it's simple human nature yes oh. <laughs> sorry um, one comparison which Professor Gamble didn't make uh, bet uh, with Mrs. Be between uh, a historical figure and Mrs. Thatcher was with Robert Peel, and I just wondered um, how you feel that uh, the, the, the two uh, figures are in, in some sense um, similar. Peel was actually an outsider. He was also, uh, as it happens, a provincial northerner. Uh, he was uh, really extremely liberal and, and radical in terms of the policies he implemented. In some paradoxical ways, in particular with regard to central banking and uh, the provision of money, he was rather statist. Um, he took on vested interests in a way which was extremely hard-headed, ended up splitting his party entirely, and also, rather like Mrs. Thatcher, ended up with both major parties agreeing with the position that he had taken, which led to the split in the first place. Uh, I would add to the list, the list of his achievements, not exactly an achievement, this one, but um, his government actually began to take uh, steps to relieve the Irish famine in a way which, had they been continued, and even better if they'd been increased, would not have produced the terrible results. I mean, they, I don't think any could have stopped terrible results, but, we, but the British would not have the reputation for having um, looked at that um, famine with uh, dispassionate uh, unconcern that they do have in so many places. So now, as regards the general comparison, I think the, the case you make is a strong one, and uh, my opinion on that is less... Uh, 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 useful than the fact that Norman Gash, the great biographer of Peel, he thought Mrs. Thatcher was the successor to Peel uh, in Tory politics. Uh, at least he, that was what he, he said to a, a group I was uh, um, when he spoke to us. And um, so that I think counts, counts quite, a, quite a long way. But